Hello, Mr. Wardlaw. How's it going? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. This this technology is all new to me, but yeah. I hear you talk about working from home, and I'm going to be doing the same here before long, and that's where this little thing comes from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's actually not that complicated. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's actually really cool. I don't know. I, I suck at technology, but it's easy enough that I managed to somehow pull it off. So, right. <laughs> the, the working from home is a little different because that's all my work stuff. So there, it's a different setup, but similar. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I have the whole headset too for work. But right. I'm yeah. Not yeah. I use I, work I, equipment except for. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So yeah, I've really been enjoying this podcast you have, especially the ones you've done with Mike and everything, because. Oh, yeah there's so much about Lycia that I never knew because all I've ever known is the music and I've listened to it and I've seen very little interview footage or anything. And, yeah. and even my introduction to Lycia was, you know, through burned CDs that a friend of mine gave me. So funny. I didn't even know what order they came in. I just assumed until later I found out, you know, what came first and came oh, later. That's so funny. Um, yeah. Mike's pretty elusive. Um, <laughs> yeah. and he's also doesn't really talk about a lot of like, it, he won't talk about drama a whole lot. So, right. it's, um, there's a lot that he, that we could talk about, but we've gotten <laughs> a little bit more loose lipped about it recently. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's tons more. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Yeah. <laughs> but um that's funny that you just got all the CDs burned because that's how I got introduced to Lycia too though. At my time it was on cassette. This right. was before CDs. So I got yeah. an Ionia cassette and then that was my introduction to Lycia. And then of course I hunted him down. <laughs> um and he sent me cassettes. So I still didn't have CDs. I had cassettes. Yeah. That's how old we are. That's funny. Um, yeah, that's funny. Yes, it was around 2004. I was 24 at the time. And this girl who I'd met, she, uh, you know, like I was trying to turn her on to a bunch of new music. So I gave her some Therian CDs and said, you need to check this out. It's really cool. And she burned me some Lycia and like soul whirling somewhere and everything. Oh, cool. And so it was just the right time for me. It was just, it hit right. I mean, it was just something really new and I was really excited about it. So I made her burn me everything else she had from you all. And uh, that's funny. Yeah. And so it was like, not even until I think when a line that connects came out and that's like probably the first Lycia album I bought from you all directly as oh, it came wow. out. Yeah. So I didn't even know there was more than you and Mike involved because, you know, the music, the way it hit me, it's just like, this is, I don't know. It just seemed, seemed so minimal. I couldn't imagine more than two people making it, you know? That's funny. Yeah. I never knew there was this whole cast of other characters that were involved. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And well, and for a long time, it was just the two of us. Yeah. So I, I get why you would think that, but it's yeah. been really super fun those last couple of releases to have like everybody involved in it, including Michael Irwin, who Mike worked with back in the eighties. And so it's been sort of fun working with people and like the different styles that they bring out right. and then, and then how we play off that. So it's been really fun. And um our ep is gonna be coming out fairly soon I, I don't think i'm allowed to tell anything about it yet but yeah it's um it's gonna be more along that line too where it's varied like it's very it, each song is very different mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see i mean it's not going to be drastically different it's not like right. crazy or anything it makes sense <laughs> if you're listening to the last couple albums it makes complete sense but um right. Um, I could see like if somebody only knew like Ionia and Start Corner or in Burning Circle or something, they'd be like, what the heck? Like, well, yeah. we've been doing all this stuff the whole time. You just maybe didn't hear that CD or something, but right. I'm, I'm anxious for it to come out just so that we can be done and rest I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been i've been watching the little teasers you've been putting up and everything so i've been really looking forward to that myself i love in flickers it was a great album yeah 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 it's, yeah. it's been um 
It's been a good couple of years for us musically. Not, I'm not saying like we're good, yeah. but just a lot of creative output and um, a lot of fun working with other people and um, the labels that we worked with and stuff like that. So it's been, it's been fun. Well, very cool. Yeah, I know it was a, you know, I've heard like about how I guess it was really the metal heads that kind of breathed a lot of life into Lycia and that really, uh, yeah, for it was. Sure. Yeah, and I mean, I'm definitely one of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, in the 90s, it was mostly the goth crowd or whatever. And right. then um, that scene sort of waned there for a while. And it was really sort of the metal scene that was evolving. And um, I mean, we have to give Peter Steele credit because right. he sort of sucked us into that world and... Um, sounded weird but he uh, <laughs> no but he really you know introduced us to a lot of people that wouldn't have heard of, of us otherwise and yeah. so it and the way the scene has evolved I think it's super healthy right now where like in metal there's so many different types of genres dark wave post-punk doom like all this stuff kind of meshing together and right. creating this um better scene I think because it's I feel like I feel like metal people are more open to listening to different types of music than some other genres um yeah. but there again two things have changed there as well I think the scene's just way more open-minded now than it used to be I mean yeah, like I mean, because when we opened for typo negative it did yeah. not go well so right. I mean there was a couple shows that were good but it was uh painful to say, to say the least but yeah. um you know in the end it worked out really well and we're glad that we did that obviously because it was a great experience but yeah. um definitely um the interest recently has mostly been from metal and then of course now post-punk is back yeah, that's been back for a while yeah. um, and the whole dark wave thing's happening again so it's all just i think it's a good time for music Absolutely. You know, I think a lot of people, they, they have a negative opinion about the streaming services. And like, for me, though, the one thing I really like about it, like something like Spotify is they have those, you know, curated playlists that they just suggest yeah. to you. And one of the things I really like about that is that nobody's told me anything about this artist. I haven't listened to anything about them before. I don't see a picture of them, nothing. All I hear is the music they make. Yeah. And I base my opinion off of that. And I've discovered some great artists that way. And yeah. me being me, you know, I'll, because I'm in a position to do so, I'll go out and buy the album afterward. Yeah. I understand, you know, royalties on Spotify are paltry, but, you know. I don't care. Yeah. Honestly, like we're not one of those, we're not that band that, that gets but heard about that stuff like right. most of our music on Bandcamp, we have name your own price you can take it for free you can yeah. pay whatever you want for it if you want to pay for it good to go but yeah. we're, we're just we're more concerned with um just sharing the music and I exactly mean, you want it i mean I, the, the only reason we care if it sells is that we want the record label to make their money back on it you know what i mean right. like yeah we don't want to leave somebody with stock sitting there or whatever but as far as like streaming services i think they're fantastic i'm the same with you i've discovered so many bands mm -hmm. by accident you know right um yeah old stuff even that i'd never heard of you know so i think it's fantastic yeah and why you know it's the thing too it's like as opposed because i don't know if you're like me it's like after you reach a certain age and somebody says hey you need to check this out i think you're like a, yeah i'll listen to it sometime you know <laughs> and yeah. then you, you maybe you do maybe you don't or is this you don't have anybody necessarily pushing it on you it just happens to float into your ears because it's part yeah. of your daily mix and yeah. yeah but then like um also you know uh kind of like the artist that you suggested a handful of years ago you were talking about drab majesty mm -hmm. and i checked out um the demonstration mm -hmm. and man i listened to that album like every day for months same and I on find, repeat yeah i <laughs> yeah. couldn't get enough of that album so yeah. i eventually bought the vinyl of that so just this yeah. last year yeah um, so how yeah. do you go ahead how do you feel about the whole like vinyl explosion and all that? Like, do you have any opinions on that? I'm totally on. I mean, I think yeah. it's, um, 
I think it's super cool. I think that it's, it, to me, it's art. Like, I know a lot of people are into vinyl because they love the sound of it. Right. For me, it's like the overall package of it. Like, I think, I think it's like a piece of art that you can listen to. And I, 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 I love all the variations. Mm -hmm. I know some people don't like the colored vinyl. They, you know, they're purists and they want black and they're, right. they're for the, you know, <laughs> the audio quality of it and stuff like that. But I just, I love it. Like I follow some vinyl um, pages just because they post these beautiful vinyl, you know, and I'm just like, how did that artist come up with that? Like the combination of colors and the style or like, I love it. I yeah. think it's super cool. I think it's, um, I think it's actually breathed a lot of life into music because of the collector's aspect of it. Like you mentioned the demonstration. Right. I mean, they've had like how many variations of that vinyl at this point, like a million yeah. different variation. Soft kill does the same thing. They're constantly putting out new, um, you know, new products or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's um, it's kind of brought the fun back to music because back in the day, you'd go to the record store and you would hunt through all the stuff and you would find something that you loved. And I think it's kind of ignited that in a way again. Right. Um, and of course, we love it when one of our records comes out on vinyl because yeah. it's like this special piece of art, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I really dig it, and but at the same time, I feel like, you know, because I started buying records initially whenever I was in my early teens, and the reason mm -hmm. I was buying the records is because they were way cheaper than I could get them on CD with these older releases. That's so I'd go to, too. Yeah, so I'd go to the used record store, and I could pick up, like, you know, Iron Maiden's Killers on vinyl for, like, five bucks. If I wanted to buy the new CD, it was going to cost me, like, 17 There was yeah. no contest. And yeah. then it was cool to have, you know, that big artwork, and I mean, yeah. especially, and, you know, I think they talk about that whole immersive experience, and I, I do remember sitting there in my basement, you know, with that on repeat, just staring at that cover art, you know? Yeah, totally. So, so that was always cool. But I also feel now that it seems that a lot of times, like the, you know, maybe the format it comes out on is almost more important to some people than what's actually on it. And, that can happen too. Yeah. It's the, yeah, that's when the collector thing kind of Right. It, it's like the same kind of mentality of someone who collects purses where they don't even care about the functionality of the purse. It's like they're yeah. collecting it because it's got such and such name on it or whatever. It, and I, it, I'm sure it's probably like that with a lot of people. Like they buy the album and they don't even listen to it. It's like they just have it to say they yeah. have it kind of thing, which is right. fine. I mean, you like what you like. The reason why you like it is really irrelevant, but yeah. I could I could see how that could happen to um, whatever to each yeah. their own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. For me, it was kind of like more personal because I, you know, I got lucky enough to have a musical project that got on a semi-popular underground label. I was in a band called Vault Wraith and we had an album on Hell's Headbangers and we got this beautiful artwork done and it came out on this really nice variant and everything. And I mean, it looked amazing, right? But my ultimate fear is that everybody who bought that album bought it based on those reasons and then never put it on their turntable. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, or that, or that, you know, it's like maybe this doesn't live up to the artwork that's on there, you know, because you put so much money into getting this great art you yeah. don't know if like people value the music on the same level but that's my own personal struggle yeah. <laughs> yeah well i think i mean you could say that kind of about anything style over substance you know like you might see a band that looks super cool like they've got the look down they've got the stage presence and their music is just fucking awful right so, I, I mean <laughs> so i'm sure that i'm sure that happens a lot with vinyl where they've got it down the look is beautiful it's you know they spent a lot of money on this packaging and then you pop it out and you're just like yeah, yeah. but again you know art is subjective it's like i'll have a lot of people like ask me to listen to their music and stuff and it stresses me out so bad right because first of all who has time? Like, I don't, I'm not trying to be yeah. an ass, but like, I literally don't have time. Like you were mentioning earlier about people sending you music. Yeah. People send me music like, oh, you got to check out this band and this stuff. And I'm like, I want to, but yeah. I just don't have the time. 
And so then I feel stressed out because I'm not putting the time into this person. Like they're, they want me to listen to this music so bad because mm -hmm. they want to share this thing with me that they love. And then I'm like, but I don't have time. And yeah. so I, like, I feel stressed out about it. And it's just kind of the same thing. Like when somebody will say, hey, can you listen to my band? And I just, I'm like, oh, because <laughs> right. first of all, I don't like, again, I don't have the time. But secondly, my opinion is really irrelevant. It's completely yeah. irrelevant. Taste is so subjective. Like just because I like it or don't like it doesn't make it a good thing or a bad thing. Like it just, my opinion is completely irrelevant on the topic. Now, if you ask me a question about, um, recording quality first of all you're barking up the wrong tree because uh, i don't know anything about anything but like technically i might be able to give you some technical thing of like drink lots of water and use drink lemon <laughs> before you, i mean i don't even do these things by the way but but you know what i mean but like as far as like do i like your music yes or no don't ask right. me because i i have such weird taste anyway yeah. it, it's it's ridiculous and it just it's going to make us both feel awkward. I'm right. going to feel bad that you're asking me for an opinion and you're going to feel bad because I'm not giving you what you want from it. Like you want some critique, some detailed critique of this made me feel this way and this and this and this. And I'm just like, do you like it? If you like it, that's all that matters. You right. know? Ugh. It just stresses me out so bad. It was um me and uh, my bandmates were actually having this very conversation recently, and you know, granted, we I've never like toured or anything, but I've played in local bands for like, twenty plus years and everything. Yeah. And so every now and then you'll be after a, after a show, you'll be talking to people and be like, "Hey, what'd you think of us?" And it's like, so you know, you say, yeah, great set, but it's like I don't do that. <laughs> it's like if You're I putting feel like, the person on the spot. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too, it's like, if I don't have enough confidence to think that I did well enough, you know, it's like, I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm not looking for validation from other people. And you shouldn't be, right. you really shouldn't be because if you're content with like, and, and I'll give you a perfect example of this. So the very, one of the very first times I sang live, I sang mm -hmm. in this little tiny club in Columbus. And Gordon Sharp from Cindy Talk, this mortal coil was there because at the time he happened to live in Columbus and we became friends. And I was super insecure. I mean, I'm, I'm a ball of insecurity. And after the set, I was like, how what, did it sound OK? And he was like, did you think it sounded OK? And that's all yeah. he would tell me. Yeah. And now he was probably sparing my feelings, which I appreciate, <laughs> but, but it's, but it's true though. It's like, if you felt good about it, then feel good about it. If you felt bad about it, then figure out what you need to fix next time. But right. randomly asking somebody, Hey, what do you think of my music is so awkward. Like you're putting that person in a really awkward position because yeah. then if they don't like it, they're either going to lie to you, which yeah. serves no purpose or they're going to say, it's not really my cup of tea. And then you're going to feel like shit about it. So it's, right. I don't know that I've ever asked anybody, Hey, what do you think about my music? Because yeah. it's just, I don't, I probably don't want to know. Right. <laughs> it's probably not going to make me feel better about myself. And I don't need ego stroking. Like, yeah, it's just awkward. I don't take compliments anyways, because if someone tells you they love it, I'm just going to tell you why you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I've got a lot of musician friends like that. You know, there's like, hey, man, that was a great set. Oh, really? Well, I did this wrong. And yes. this one is like, yeah, but I didn't hear it. So please exactly. take the compliment and go have a drink or something. <laughs> yeah, know? I know. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember so many times, like we would play this sh these shows, and we'd walk off stage and be like, "Well, we failed again," and right. people would be coming up to us and be like, "Oh, that was great," and we were like, "Really? That was awful. The sound sucked. This happened." Blah blah. And then you just look at their little faces, get like crestfallen, like just. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, <laughs> but I, try, I try to keep that in mind because people right. people typically there's one of two people. They either really want to see the best in you. Or they mm -hmm. want to see the worst in you. Right. Neither opinion, neither opinion is truly accurate. So that's true. You know, just, <laughs> yeah. don't, just don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> 
but you know it's funny like I, you talk about these stories about like you know with the typo negative crowd being so rough on you all and everything and the thing is is like i was never a typo negative fan for years but i got into typo negative at the same time i got into lycia because the same person cool. is the one who turned me on to it and like with typo i did the same thing with cradle of filth i kind of took a look at the image and the people that were into him and said, yeah, not for me. <laughs> right. But then later, whenever I actually heard the music and really broke it down and listened to it, I was, you know, really surprised at how much depth there was to it. Yeah. And, uh, I was, uh, yeah. So I really love like world coming down. That's probably one of my favorite albums now. Yeah. That, that record's really good. And I, it's so dark. Like, yeah, I think that's why I like it so much. Cause it's so dark. Yeah, and it's like you never realized how personal his lyrics were, you know. It's because you know what they were doing. This set MTV was selling an image, and that's what you have yeah. to do to break a band, you know, because sure. you have to get through to people that want that. Yeah. But uh, you know, but there was yeah, definitely a lot more going on there that I didn't realize whenever I was a you know knucklehead yeah. teenager. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you say that though, because you know, like like you said, like record labels, etc. They're trying to push an image because they're that's how they sell records right. so they try to place you in whatever box they decide to place you in and so we were put in that sort of goth thing back in the yeah. day and and then we would show up to our shows and like not fit the image and right. so people would be all disappointed or whatever and then you know like years after the fact we would hear similar to what you just said where people would be like, oh, I just thought you guys were a dumb goth band. Like, I never listened to your music because I just thought you were one of those dumb goth bands or whatever. Right. And there's nothing wrong with goth bands. Nothing. No. Right. Do you. Look how you want to look, sound like you want. I don't care. Like, I, I will support you a thousand percent doing what you do. But that doesn't necessarily mean it has to fit me. <laughs> right. You know, so it, it's, it, it's, it's a it's a hard thing when you're like sort of into dark stuff because you're automatically going to be sort of lumped yeah. into certain things and i'm sure peter would tell you the exact same thing about his situation where they're like we're just like doing black sabbath and beatles like right music like yeah but it is what it is right well you know it's funny because yeah the whole like god thing too it's um i don't know i feel like with any genre there's a handful of really good bands that were innovators and kind of like you know develop develop the scene and you know kind of bring yeah. about the um, ethics and everything and just the look and all that and then you have all these people that jump on board and try to kind of mm -hmm. copy that and that's where you get the kind of just the piles of bands that are very interesting but in any scene yeah. there's usually at least a handful of really good bands you know absolutely and you yeah. can usually tell them like yeah that's a hundred percent true because in the 90s there was this whole goth industrial thing mm -hmm. that sprang up and everything and like the first bands that did it were interesting right but then by the time people start copycatting it just gets watered down and watered down and you just sound like a bunch of clones doing the exact same thing and it's yeah. like this um, routine, it, it, it just gets boring after a while. And the same right. thing is sort of happening right now, like in the music scene, there's like all of these bands that kind of revived certain sounds who are super interesting and really good. And then there's a bunch of people that were like, oh, I have a Casio keyboard. I can hit two yeah. keys on it and drone sing over top of it. And it's like, not the same <laughs> right but yeah like you know it's like when i heard lycia i never you know i never would have lumped you all in with like christian death or anything like that it was just such a right. unique sound yeah i mean like ionia is definitely i mean me has a bit of a goth vibe to it but even then there's a lot of difference there you know like yeah. that instrumental track fate that's one of my favorite things on that and uh like I said, that just doesn't sound like any goth band I ever heard. <laughs> yeah, and like if you if you talk to Mike, like the stuff that he was listening to, it's like The Who, mm -hmm. Yes, Pink Floyd, Wire, Killing yeah. Joke. Like if you if you list if you know all the stuff he was listening to, it all makes sense in the context of Lycia. Right. He wasn't listening to goth music, you know. Yeah. 
he listened to a lot of post-punk and stuff like that, but he wasn't, and, and it's no, we're not being offensive towards any of these bands, no, but right. none of us, none of us in the band listened to like Christian death and yeah. any of those kind of like, uh, whoever else you want to say. Yeah. It just wasn't the thing that, I mean, I wasn't exposed to it living in rural Ohio for one thing. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was exposed to it, I was already listening to other stuff that was different. So to get all sort of like lumped into the same genre, like I get it because there's a dark aesthetic to it, right. but it's, but to say like, you're this, and then you yeah. come out with something that's not that, then people are like, what the hell, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like we have some Mediterranean style songs right? Uh, coming out and like Spanish guitar and whatever, but it all fits in the context of, you know, Mike's been doing music since the 80s. So right. there's some dancey stuff on there. There's some heavier stuff. On, it all fits in the grand scheme if you listen to it from start to finish. But I think some people who have like, let's say Ionia in their mind are going to yeah. hear this and be like, what the heck? This is like out of context. But right. from start to finish, it's completely in context, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Hey, it's hard for me to pick out certain tracks I think are great because like, I don't even really read the song titles a lot with Lycia. I just put it on and listen to the entire album. Mm -hmm. But that last song on In Flickers, I think is my favorite one on the whole thing. And it's just, a, I, I think it's, a, is it Autumn Into Winter? Is that what mm -hmm. it's called? I, yeah, I love that song. Yeah, that song kills me. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good Sometimes, one. like, because I'm, first and foremost, I'm a Lycia fan. I hunted yeah. Mike down, literally yeah. hunted him down. Right. So, and when he's creating music, I don't hear it until he's ready for my input or whatever. And yeah. so sometimes, like, I'll hear something that he writes and I'm just like, how does this come out of you? Like, where does this come from? You know? Right. It, it's because I live with them. So I just know him as the guy that lives in my house. You know what I mean? Like he goes right. to work every day, comes home, we have a kid yeah. and then he'll play me these songs. And I'm just like, where the hell did you get that? Like, where does that come from? Yeah. You know? And it's, um, I mean, I'm just as like stymied by it. <laughs> this right. song. And, and I'm like you too. Like I, I can't name my own song titles half the, like 90% of the time. I just, it's all music and it, it's yeah. like a giant piece of art, I guess. I don't yeah. know. I'm the same way. I, if you <laughs> ask me, if you ask me to name my own solo album, put the songs on, I'm like, I don't know. Right. Yeah. You could make something up, and I'd believe you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I heard him like in one of your recent interviews you had with him, where he was talking about how he was doing a lot more finger style flamenco mm -hmm. stuff, and that's cool. I uh, yeah. You know, I've, dabbled around some classical guitar myself too and it's just it's such a departure from just playing chords or like you know scales because it's just you're doing rhythm bass and everything all on the guitar and it's it's yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mind fuck so to say <laughs> like, yeah, to try to wrap your head around it he, he's almost like he, he felt like he wasn't playing guitar enough you know because you get used to sort of relying on your effects right you know and so the effects is were a huge part of this the overall sound and but he used to do tons of um playing yeah. when he was younger and so he we weren't doing a lot of music and stuff so he just grabbed his acoustic guitar and start messing around with it and then he decided he was going to teach himself one song and um taught himself that song and then so like that's it's fun to him now because it's so hard to do right you know and it's funny because um scott from zasser yeah i don't know if you you know zasser not really they um were like huge black metal okay band, black metal band but now he plays all of this you should actually you should really look it up it's um i'll send you a link after this but Sounds he good. does all these intricate you know acoustic stuff and like he's all acoustic now and um it's really dark and intricate stuff that he's playing but yeah. it's interesting how like people are sort of evolving along right. the same sort of path you know yeah well, i think a lot too you know a lot of those uh 
just like the ones who came out just as full-on black metal bands eventually mm-hmm. did evolve into what I think is more interesting music, you know, because it got yeah. more melodic and everything with the keyboards and stuff like that. I mean, you have some of these bands, like there's that whole um, war metal scene. I don't know if you're familiar with that or whatever, but it's I just... No I mean, it's just a bunch of guys playing as fast as they can. Nobody plays anything above the fifth fret, and they're all supposed to be just really depressed and hate everything. But, you know, they're touring and trying to sell records. Like, if you're not having a good time, why in the hell are you doing this? But, you know, it's a big Paying bills, I guess. Yeah, but it's a big pose. And, like, unfortunately, I think some of their fans can't see beyond that. But, Mm. you know, I think it's more interesting when people do kind of branch out from the norm and try to like you know when they don't make such you know strict rules for themselves as far as what they're gonna do yeah i completely like first of all as a person what does that get boring doing the same thing over and over and over exactly and then and secondly like what's the point you've already you've already said and done that why are you doing it again like yeah i think it's interesting to do different things and so let me ask you this question because i People will ask, like, if I don't know somebody that well or whatever, they'll say, well, what kind of music do you listen to? I don't know. Like, I don't even know how to describe my taste because it's so stupid. Right. And you, I, I'm not, I don't like metal. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't like goth music, but there's things in all of those things that I do like. So it's like, do you have a hard time classifying? Like if someone says, what kind of music are you into? Like, how do you even give an answer to that? Yeah, I mean, I can throw out some examples, whatever, you know, I can right. list a few favorite bands, but trying to nail down a genre, no, Yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know, typically, like, the way I like to describe the music that I really like is stuff that hits right when the lights are out, <laughs> that's kind of, the, you know. And that's so subjective, because exactly. it, could be, it could be everything from Black Sabbath to uh, uh, Lee Hazelwood. You know, exactly. I, it, it, there's there's no way to define that. Yeah. And I think I think that's what's interesting, like about a lot of the bands now, because like take somebody like Chelsea Wolfe. Mm-hmm. What is she? Right. She's not metal. No. Nah. She's not goth. She's not. I don't even know what. Like, what is that? Yeah, she's the same thing. Yeah, same thing for like my friend Sarah Timms from Black Mare. It's like. Yeah. They're just making really good, interesting, dark music, you know? Right. Um, well, but I don't know what you call that. I don't know what, yeah. how would you describe that? I don't know. Exactly. Nighttime music, I guess, would be the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sad, reflective, creepy nighttime music. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned Chelsea Wolf. She actually did um, a, con- she uh, did a collaboration with an artist I listened to called Mercure. I yeah, think yeah, I'm pronouncing yeah. that right, like M Y R K U R. Yeah. And again, here's a great example where I was telling you about how like Spotify or something just turned me on to music with her. I heard this song and I thought, that's amazing. What is it? And I looked it up and found it. And yeah. the next thing I find is this big backlash because I guess she did like, you know, she had a pop project whenever she started out or whatever. And then she went off into metal. And so all these purist assholes are like just slandering her online and talking about her using drum machines, whatever. It's like, I don't give a rat's ass how she's making the music she's making. I like it because I heard it and that's what I heard, you know? And so, yeah. Uh, Seamsters suck. Yeah, Yeah, they do. (laughs) And the thing of it is, it's like, okay, if you're so concerned about what's in her closet, what's in yours? What were you listening to that you don't want anybody to know about? Right. (laughs) You know? Yeah. And and who cares? Like, really, who cares? Yeah. And it tends to be, you know, people who are like, you know, born 20 years after that whole initial black metal scene in Norway happened and everything that. Yeah. So essentially, they're posers too. (laughs) <laughs> exactly and that's another thing you know some people throw that word around all the time posers and i find the ones who are out calling everybody a poser are usually the ones who fit the description the most pretty much yeah, <laughs> yeah. pretty much and yeah. you know and it's it's like why are you gatekeeping everything like just let right. people like what they like and why do you care like yeah I, that's another thing that irritates me i've talked to the, about this so many times about the internet where it's like People won't let people just like what they like. Right. They've always got to have some negative commentary about it, whether it's music, a movie, a book, a TV show, whatever. It's like, 
just let people like what they like. Why do you find it necessary to like crap on stuff? You know, like, right. I mean, it's even, it's, it's even stupid stuff like the Super Bowl. you know, it's like, yeah, pe- let people be excited for their stupid game. Like, why do you have to post? I hate this. Like, yeah. who cares? Let them like it. Don't watch <laughs> it. If you don't want to watch it, you know, you go do whatever you do during the Super Bowl. Who cares? You know, go right. watch Puppy Bowl or whatever <laughs> option that else they have. But it's it's really it's really weird. Like people have to turn everything into a competition, or it's just so bizarre to me. Yeah, I mean, I think after I reached a certain age, I tried to be aware of that in myself because, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I participate in all that stuff when I was younger. Of course. But, yeah, but I think Same. it just. Yeah, but it gets to a point where I think like my philosophy has just been I'm going to champion the things I like and I'm going to tell everybody I can about those things yeah. and the things I don't like. Well, then I'm just not going to worry about that. Yeah. And, and especially with bands and musicians and any kind of art, it's like, OK, even though you don't find any value in that, that one, you know, cheesy, crappy pop song that you don't like, maybe you got somebody through a hard time in their lives. I mean, Completely. it's just. Yeah. And so, and therefore, you know, it has value just even if yeah. you don't see it. And if yeah. anything, it makes you appreciate the stuff you do appreciate sure. even more. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. I think that's the healthiest, <laughs> I mean, that's the healthiest way to look at it. I think, I think when you're young, it's natural to be sort of tribal about everything. You know, like when I was young, I grew up in rural Ohio. So it was like, when you were different, you were different. Right. And <laughs> it was in the 80s and 90s like you could get your ass kicked just because you had a nose ring so yeah you were like saying something by putting yourself out there being different and I think at that point like me and my friends it was so important for everybody to know that we weren't like them you know what I mean now as an adult you're just like who even cares like I don't care if you know what I listen to or you know who cares but yeah. I think when you're young, you sort of behave that way because it's like my tribe against your tribe and all this stuff. Yeah. You should grow out of that at some point. But some people never grow out of that. They still want to hold on to these like, this is mine. You're not allowed over here. Yeah. And I don't like what you like. And it's like, we can all just chill. Like, we don't have to be so divisive about literally everything. Yeah. Well, I see a lot of times too, with some of these older musicians, like especially older underground musicians who live in my community and stuff, a lot of them are just, they, you know, they just do nothing but like piss and moan about the current yeah. state of music or stuff like that. You know, they're talking about like, well, people who are creating music with, you know, computers are not even doing this or that. And it's like, but it's no different. What you are doing now, what you were doing in the 80s is like a dumbed down version of what somebody was doing in the 60s. And what they sure. were doing was a dumbed down version of everything sure. else. And it's like, it's all the same seven notes or whatever. It's just how they arrange it. And if somebody's getting something out of it, be happy that the kids are into music and if you don't like it well then it's not for you right and you know it's sort of like that's the same sort of i mean this is extreme but it's the same sort of mentality of like well back in my day we didn't have medicine to cure chicken (laughs) pox you know or like okay but we do now yeah (laughs) don't don't be mad at the kid that gets the chicken pox vaccine just because you didn't have that option as a child and got the chicken pox like yeah. I think that creativity is creativity and there were people making generic music back in the day just like there's people making generic music now it's, right you're either creative or you're not creative you're either pushing boundaries or you're not pushing boundaries either way who cares there's people right. that only like pop music because they don't want to sit and wallow in their misery they want to be yeah. stupid and happy and let's pretend the world is great and that's fine do your thing you know And then other people want to sit in the dark and want to die when they listen to music. Like that's, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) you're allowed to have those feelings, (laughs) you know? Yeah. It's, um, I actually had this conversation recently (laughs) because I mean, there is, you know, obviously we're musicians and we're, you know, so we're really into a lot of different music and we listen to a lot of stuff that maybe a lot of people wouldn't like, we could put on some kind of droning thing and really get into it where somebody else wouldn't. Right. Um, but, you know, take movies, for example, um, 
my wife and I watched this movie recently and it was, it was, it was, it was, it was sorted lives. It was a play and then they made a movie of it, but the movie is essentially just them doing the play, but it's filmed. Okay. But for me, that's, it was, it was so inside baseball. I'm like, man, where's the cinematography? Where's a great score? Show me some good cuts. This is just, it's too dry for me yeah. because I'm not an actor. <laughs> you right, know? Right, right. So, but like, whereas an actor could probably watch that and really get something out of the performances. And it's not to say that I don't notice a great performance, but obviously I'm a little dumber in that genre than like say you know an actor or somebody who works on movies would be so therefore yeah. I need all that extra stuff to get my thrill when I watch yeah, a movie yeah yeah see, yeah see and for me music movies tv books whatever is pure escapism yeah so like like you I probably wouldn't have liked that movie either because I want the escapism I want everything there yeah um you know and it's kind of the same with music where there could be maybe only one or two instruments but it overwhelms you with yeah. like vibe and emotion and whatever and i guess that's probably what i'm looking for out of music like i want the mood you know what i mean yeah. i want to feel it i want to picture myself in a dark cave with candles <laughs> and i'm yeah. being dramatic but you know what i mean like gotcha or outside under the moon or whatever like yeah so but i also like stupid crap so yeah i mean i posted humpty dance earlier <laughs> i like that every bit as much as i like other things yeah. you know it, it we all have our bizarre quirks in taste yeah. i guess but <laughs> yeah I find that a lot of the cheesy pop music that I kind of like, you know, put my nose up at years ago. Now it's kind of a nostalgia trip when I hear those songs. 100%. And so, yeah. And so therefore yeah. it's, yeah, I'm not upset with them anymore. I just yeah. think about what I was doing at the time that yes. I hated that song. Yes. And that, <laughs> yeah. And that's where I am because yeah. I hated all of that, like hip hop, like, um all that stuff like Belle Biv DeVoe and like all that stuff that was popular when I was in high school I absolutely hated it yeah and like Def Leppard I hated all of that <laughs> crap like all yeah. that hair metal and I hated oh, all yeah. of it because I was too cool right you know? yeah. too cool to listen to that now if I'm in the car and Def Leppard comes on I guarantee I'm cranking the radio up right or like and like like again like I said I posted that you know Humpty Dance earlier I hated that song when that came out now yeah. I'm like, that is a great song. Like, yeah, I don't know. Our taste change, but a lot of it is totally nostalgia. You right. know, like that. I think that's one of the reasons I loved WandaVision so much. Yeah. Because they went through, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but they um, went through all the eras of TV. And oh, so yeah. seeing like, I think the first was like um, Dick Van Dyke show or something. And then they moved through the decades and so it felt so nostalgic and comfortable for that reason because like still i mean still to this day like if i want escapist television i'll put on you know some black and white like bewitched or you know three right. company or something from when i was a kid and you know realistically like if three company came on came out right now and i yeah. turn that on i'd be like this is garbage right you know <laughs> yeah but the, but because of the um, connection to it emotionally from being a kid and everything and it's the same kind of stuff with this music it's like all I can remember is being at the dance after the football game and these stupid songs coming on that I hated and yeah. me and my friends dancing around like morons <laughs> laughing our butts <laughs> off and having a good time so it's funny how um, you know and the same thing happened with a lot of really the goth stuff that I absolutely hated yeah. Back when I used to go to clubs, like, and I'm not going to name any band names, whatever, but there was a lot of music that I just hated. Right. And now I put it on and listen to it every so often because I'm like, it reminds me of being like 20 years old and being in the club with my friends and having a good time and, and whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that probably happened at this point. Lycee has been around so long that I know that there are certain people that quit listening after like you know burning circle because yeah. it's no different than the cure where people right. love everything up till like disintegration or whatever then they quit listening or you know yeah. whatever whatever period that they found the band right is the most important to them generally 
and yeah. um, you know we all have that same same thing for me with swans the cure like all you know you have your favorite set of records that right. you have like that emotional attachment to um, yeah and that's just human nature that's just how we are well then also you know i think you realize too after you re- try to record music yourself it's like okay like if you get enough songs together to make one decent album in your lifetime that's something now when you think of these bands that you really coveted whatever the fact that they had more than two is pretty astonishing (laughs) you know it's so like whenever now whenever a band that i loved whatever just kind of you know lays an egg as far as i'm concerned i don't try to get too worked up about it i'm just like well think of all these other great albums they released and it's like they can't just keep doing that you know because yeah and i think the same thing too that happened because i think about this all the time too it's like that band probably values what they're currently working on every bit as much as what they valued right in the past and so to them usually whatever you're working on at the time is the most important thing to you and yeah. you're like, this is the best thing I've ever done. I'm so proud of this, whatever. You're not thinking like, well, this doesn't measure up to my album three albums ago, you know? Yeah. So I always try to think about that because like for The Cure, for instance, like, you know, a lot of people don't really like the newer stuff, which the newer stuff is now old, but <laughs> um, you know what I mean? But, right. and, and, I, and I have the same reaction. Like my favorite Cure stuff is the old stuff but it's because of the emotional attachment you had to it when you first heard it and like where you were in your life and what was going on with you as a person. And then you found this record and it meant so much to you. And so you just don't emotionally connect as much to other stuff, you know? Yeah. Speaking of which, um, one of my favorite current bands just released a new album today and I believe they're called Kwan. It's like K A U A N. They're this, uh, russian band but i believe they sing all their songs in finnish and i don't know if you've ever heard of them or not yeah have you ever heard so. yeah have you ever heard of a incident called the was it the diot love pass incident i don't know this Lay was it on me okay so uh, you're kind of into spooky stuff i know yeah. i've heard you talk on some of your other yeah. episodes okay so this was over in russia in the ural mountains these five hikers i guess I already know this story. Right. So they disappeared and they found them all shredded and nobody knows what the hell happened to them. Okay. So this band put out an album. It's like an hour and maybe 20 minutes worth of music that never stops. And it's all based on that. And so, I mean, it's just imagine just kind of like, you know, like cold or something. It's just like large soundscapes of just like, I mean, you feel like you're in a cold place whenever you hear this. So whenever I heard that album, it blew me away and I'm just like constantly repeated it. And so I bought everything they've put out since then. Oh, that's cool. You got to send me, send me a link to that because that sounds like something Mike would be interested in too, because he's, he's all into that, like spooky UFO, ancient aliens. Yeah. all that stuff too that and that sounds that sounds creepy like it yeah. the vibe i get is like thinking about blair witch project <laughs> right exactly except for audio, the audio version of it that yeah. sounds cool yeah and so I, I had no idea what the album was about at first i just thought wow this music's amazing you know and it's it's really cool and it's got this really neat cover it's just kind of like these four kind of hazy figures disappearing into this snowscape with their skis and it's just oh man it, it, yeah so it hits pretty heavy like i don't have their newest physical album yet i pre-ordered it but it just got released today but this is like their second to last one they did there oh that's nice yeah, yeah. so yeah i like that they're really cool and i How think cool. a, yeah i think a lot of people that were into your stuff and the kind of stuff we're into might dig them yeah it sounds like it, it sounds really I, I love dark ambient stuff um, yeah and that's yeah. Very, that's very much what they are in a lot of ways it's like they are kind of rooted in metal but i think they have just as much in common with something like pink floyd or you know yeah. tangerine dream or something yeah so. like i don't know a ton about this band but every time i hear their music i love it you know that band over oh yeah yeah that kind of gives me the vibe like of what you're talking about a little bit just that Mm. like i know they're rooted in metal like i think they used to be like a black metal band or something i'm sounding like an idiot because i really don't know 
but like some of their songs I hear them and I'm just like damn that's good like how do you even come up with this you know yeah I've listened to some Oliver and like I haven't listened to some of the newer stuff but like their earlier albums they released one I can't again i'm an idiot here too yeah, <laughs> like, I, don't know. like I, I don't know what the name of it is but it's like the music is it's recorded raw and it's all like double bass and everything just full on black metal but the nice. guy's vocals he's singing like really beautifully and there's a yeah. lot of reverb on it and so it's yeah. just it's got this really haunting oh, quality to it yeah his voice is really beautiful like it's very like he's a good singer you know yeah. like, you can't fake that like he's a good singer right and like, I, can't, I can never remember that. First of all, I can't remember my own song titles. So don't mm-hmm. shoot me for re- not remembering somebody else's. <laughs> but right. he, every once in a while, I go through this, like this, I have to go hear this song. And it's something about blood. I don't know. I have to look <laughs> it up. I just type it all over blood. And right. the song comes up me, but I'm just, the song is so freaking perfect. Yeah. And, and I just like, and this happens with other bands too. Like I'll hear something. It's so freaking good. And I'm like, where did that come from? How did you do that? Like, how did you think to put that together like that? You yeah. know, it blows my mind. Like Chelsea Wolf, I'm like, I listen to her music and I'm just like, where did that come from? You know, right. like even the subtle nuances in her vocal parts, I'm just like, it's crazy to me. Like people are so fucking good at what they do, you know? Right. It blows yeah. my mind. It's a funny segue there. Um the band Oliver. Okay. Did you ever watch the Sopranos at all? I did not. And I know, okay. I know, uh, I know. It's fine. I know I, I would love it. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's just it. I avoided it for years. And then finally it was on prime for a while. Yeah. So I just picked it up and watched it. But literally on the first season, I looked this up because, you know, I'm a dork. Um, they apparently had some kind of deal with Century Media Records to like get all these posters so if you look in the kids rooms like meadow soprano has an Oliver poster in her bedroom right on yeah and like anthony's wearing like wearing a stuck mojo t-shirt and all this other stuff so it's like all these crazy like i feel like someone just posted a screenshot from that the other day with a typo poster in the background maybe there may be yeah I, i i'd have to watch it again but yeah that seems right. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. I think it was Sopranos. I think it was a typo poster. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's cool, yeah. man. Yeah. Well, kind I of love weird. that crap. Well, just like uh, on Roseanne, um, mm-hmm. I was a huge Daisy Chainsaw fan, and Darlene had a Daisy Chainsaw poster on her wall. And right. I was just like, oh, that's so cool, because I like that band, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or anytime yeah. I spot, like, a Susie shirt or, like, a Cure shirt or something, like, on a character someplace on a show yeah it's like oh that was always cool Susie. <laughs> yeah it is cool i love it the cool thing is is that now it's like people who were into that music back in the day are now like making movies and tv right. shows and stuff so they're putting music in them that they like so it's yeah. kind of it's kind of cool when you hear a good soundtrack and i've done that many times be watching a show or a movie or something i'm like oh my god that song is so good what is that and then google search yeah. it and try to figure out what it is but yeah, yeah. That's something or even was... commercials there's some commercials and you're like what is that song that's cool I'm like look it up something i was talking about recently too i feel like a lot of times while these movies are well intended like you know the coming of age story or whatever about the weird kid or whatever i feel like they get the whole like weird kid bully dynamic wrong wrong yeah because like you know it's always like the jock is messing with the weird kid and in my experience the jocks didn't even know i existed (laughs) you know i was usually getting messed with by like some other kid who came from a similar socioeconomic background that just had crappy parents (laughs) yeah i think i think that of course everybody's experience is different yeah like it you you're you're correct because like in my school I really didn't get messed with with the kids in my actual class, like the same grade as me. We were all cool. Like the jocks were mostly cool. Everybody was pretty cool. It was the kids in the other grades that were dicks. So like my team pretty much stayed together. It's weird. And to this day, like we're all friends on Facebook. We all get along or whatever. But I mean, I definitely got messed with by jocks. For whatever reason, it was the basketball players. The football players were fine. The wrestlers were fine. (laughs) the baseball player you know whatever it was the it was the basketball players at my school I don't know I don't know what it was but 
I have never gotten treated worse than I have been from goths. So yeah. like for real, like I get along with everybody, but the people that have treated me the most shitty in my yeah. life have been goths and rednecks. That's about the yeah <laughs> they're, about, they're about equal i mean i used to get threatened all the time in ohio from rednecks right. but um yeah the goth kids were just as mean yeah yeah and so it's, and the other thing i always get to and it's because the the directors are usually into this but like these kids always have like i mean just the most impeccable taste in music but they're like 15 years old i'm like yeah where did you learn about all this shit like did, right. you didn't just magically have this rolling stone list of approved post-punk artists right. that you're into at the age of 15 you have to discover that stuff yeah when i was like 14 i was still listening to like you know green day nirvana and whatever was playing on the radio and right. i was slowly starting to discover music from my own area right but uh yeah so i don't know it's the yeah, movies <laughs> that and also if it's a boy they're also super cute like there's no way they wouldn't have girls fawning all over them or if it's <laughs> right. a girl she's gorgeous she's just wearing a pair of glasses or something ridiculous yeah but they're actually like super gorgeous and like hip and cool and in reality <laughs> they would have been super popular in their school because the girls would have wanted to be like them because they're cool and the boys would have thought they were cool or whatever yeah it's ridiculous they never have like a truly yeah awkward person play these roles usually right. you know uh, napoleon yeah. dynamite was about the most accurate yes right <laughs> like I, that, that was accurate <laughs> I was about to mention that seriously, that movie got it right. That's yeah. like the one that I was ta telling my wife about that recently. I said, you know, it's like the kind of preppy kid, whatever, just kind of rolled his eyes at Napoleon Dynamite. He didn't mess with him, but that one mm -hmm. kid was like kicking him into his locker or whatever. And he just looked like, you know, yeah, like he just came off the farm and his dad probably <laughs> clobbered him before he left the right. house. Yeah. 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 His older brother does the same, does the th same thing at home that, you know, he's doing to Napoleon exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. That, i mean that's pretty much the the, the truth of it you know yeah I mean, it's funny too is like as an adult you can look back and like okay i feel sort of sorry for the people that treated me like that because obviously something was going on with right to, yeah. to be that pissed off at the world that you're picking on some girl that you go to school with for no reason yeah um like what was happening at home you know Right. Uh, as a kid though you're just like what the hell <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> yeah yeah it wasn't until I got mean that people kind of left me alone like when you're a victim people treat you worse than when you finally are like you know what I don't really give a fuck about you people <laughs> say whatever you want and I'll tell you to go kiss my ass and like then they kind of are like oh she fights back I guess leave her alone you know yeah that kind of that kind of happened it it usually did shut people up pretty well yeah especially when they were kind of semi scared of you because they don't know what's up with you like right. i remember um these girls were being real dicks one day. i don't even remember what they're talking about or whatever they were me and my friend were walking to the hall and they were saying shit and finally i turned around and i was like i will fucking kill you <laughs> yeah <laughs> And then they're just like, holy shit, maybe she is really like legit weird, you know? Yeah. Left me alone after that. I think it was um, when I was about 15, I got my hair cut into a mohawk and when I'd come Aww. to school, like, yeah, so like, and you know, and, and that wasn't very normal at the time, right. even though, I mean, this was like 1994 five and like you know people that had mohawks in the early 80s but yeah. not so many in springfield missouri exactly yeah so i came to school with this mohawk and uh this one kid took to calling me rooster and i just didn't pay any attention right well then so one, original yeah so one day i'm sitting there in history class and you know we're waiting to go outside or something and this kid's like you know hey so did you roost this morning rooster this and that and i said no nah, actually i played with my cock and that's shutting down that's perfect <laughs> yeah. that's perfect yeah, yeah people I'll, don't know what to do when you confront them back yeah i'll never have a good comeback like that ever again yeah that was but, that was pretty much top of the heap right there yeah it's all been downhill since yeah, then yeah yeah you were clever once right exactly <laughs> yeah, once <laughs> yeah it is it is funny though um I, I yeah people don't know what to do when you sort of throw their behavior back at them it's right. interesting i mean some people are really good at it so they just fight you back but 
yeah. it usually shuts the week it's like usually it's like the kids that are trying to look cool in front of their friends so they're mm-hmm. making fun of you so that they don't look stupid and then right. when you when you throw it back at them they get freaked out because they're like oh my god now i look stupid <laughs> so you're from springfield missouri yes so i'm gonna ask you some questions about springfield missouri Go do for you it. know do you know skip skiffington I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. My God. Yeah. Oh yeah. My God. Yeah, I know Skip. <laughs> like know him, know him, or you oh, just yeah, know yeah. of him. He, he's been at my shows. He knows me by name. <laughs> he used to work with my parents at Zenith back before they shut that place down. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so do you remember Jono? Yeah, in fact, the first time I heard Lycia was because of Jono. Oh, he was such a sweet guy. Yeah, um, he yeah. actually took the song Broken Days and put that to like just a bunch of, you know, pictures of nature and stuff and everything. And he played that on a public access show he had here in oh. town. Yeah, and so he, uh, and like I watched that and I remember just me and my friends, we had a knucklehead band that was going to be on there later. So we were going to wait for our video to show on. Right. Oh, and, but cool. then, yeah. And but then that came on, but I remember we all just sat there on the couch, just kind of transfixed by Aww. that song and that video. But yeah, he John, was such a good guy. He was a good friend to me. Um, I actually met him when I was about, I was getting ready to turn 15. He had, um, this uh solo project he called himself count z yes and um yeah. there was a record store here in springfield called the mad platter and the mad platter is how i discovered local music so i remember going in there and there was this flexi record and it was just said thrash metal 50 cents and like i've got 50 cents and i like thrash metal so i bought it and it was Aww. really rough but it really spoke to me because like wait a minute nobody is into this i know they're not because it's too weird so i'm into this i just decided that and um yeah we started so i started to write him he lived in waynesville at the time which is about an hour or so away from here and uh we started writing back and forth about the time that he moved to florida and joined this satanic metal band called asheron <laughs> yeah he played keyboards for them for a while okay yeah he was a uh, his name on those albums is john scott if you ever come across okay. him but he played on a couple of albums of theirs and then when he came to springfield came back to springfield we started a band together and played around for a while oh, but that was cool. a, yeah that was a band called dark covenant and uh skip it was just a fixture in this area and so like but yeah so i met skip through john and that whole metal scene and everything okay so john uh, john o and i were pen pals yeah so we wrote back and forth for years so that's the only way we ever communicated i don't even know that email was around mm-hmm. i don't think we emailed each other i think we mostly just wrote letters yeah. and do you remember rodney uh like skip's friend rod yeah yeah uh, rod weston yes yeah okay so i know so (laughs) i was separately pen pals with him Uh and he was completely normal like our communication (laughs) is completely normal like we we talked about music there was nothing odd like he would tell me some stuff about his life or whatever but nothing was like weird or anything like that yeah and um so that's how i know rodney like i know that version of him i know that and i lost touch with him and so i know later some bad stuff and i don't know the full story or anything like that but i know some bad stuff happened yeah and how i found out about skip was that jono used to send me their cds Mm -hmm. and i would listen to these cds on repeat because they just brought me so much (laughs) effing joy <laughs> yeah to this day mike and i quote lyrics like yeah. you know because it just slow down and focus i'll say that all the time <laughs> like right. i just and i don't know where my cds are or i'd still be listening to them but yeah. just obsessed and yeah. so um of course facebook came around mm-hmm. and we were friends on there but he got weird about some stuff and I'm like, I can't deal. Like he got really yeah. like Nazi-ish or whatever. And yeah, like, I mean. 
I can't deal with that. So I, I like, I blocked him because he got really aggressive on some post one time and I'm just like, I'm not dealing with this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it's, it's still, it's fascinating to me. Like I would watch, right. I would absolutely watch a, like a reality TV yeah. about Springfield because <laughs> I, it, it just fascinating to me. And like, I, I, don't really know the whole story about what happened to Jono. I really don't know what yeah. happened to Rod. I don't know. I don't know any uh, of it. Well, Rod, I think he just passed away from some kind of medical complication or something. I'm mean, maybe a heart attack. It was, you know, but yeah, I mean, John committed suicide. I it was, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was, it was a bad deal. I mean, I'm still pretty good friends with his brother and he called me around the time that it all happened and everything, but he just, I don't know. And he, uh, you know, John, he held a, on to a lot of resentment from things, I think, that had happened years ago. And apparently, you know, he just never resolved these things. Aww. He was he was incredibly nice, but he was also incredibly sensitive. And mm-hmm. I think he was always hoping to, you know, f- find something like that. Uh, he was hoping to find success in music. And then later he started make, trying to make movies. Yeah. You know, a couple of that, you know, and then just like, I don't know. I just don't think he was ever really personally content, but he was a great friend to me. And I mean, yeah. really showed me a lot of cool music and stuff too. And yeah, you know, so we had a lot in common and I get bummed to this day, you know, like when I discovered the band slow dive, I'd never heard him before, but like I heard the song machine gun and thought, Oh my God, John would love this. And it was Aww. right around the time that he passed. And yeah, you know, I couldn't call sad. him and let him know. Yeah. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah, I miss John. He was a great Yeah, he me. was. He was such a sweet guy, just so nice. And he used to send, like I said, he used to send me the CDs and stuff. Yeah. And I wanna I feel like he was somehow connected to typo too, but I can't I don't I don't know what that connection is now. I couldn't I'm, tell you. I mean, I might be confusing him with somebody else, though. Yeah. When he lived in Florida, he recorded um, two albums. He did uh, Acid Orangutan, and then he did this one album called Vampire Circus. And I don't know if you've ever I heard remember of that, that one. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Th- that. That album is, I, I love that album. It was him and uh, this female singer. Her name was Kim. I want to say Sharp, but I may be wrong on that. But uh, that's some really great music that he did. And it was just mostly he did that with kind of a, oh, a big Korg sequencer he had. And, you know, they programmed it all. But he went to an actual studio there in Florida and paid yeah. good money to have it recorded. So it's got pretty good professional sound for the mid-90s. Yeah. But um, he yeah, was but- a truck driver, wasn't he? he was yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. he did he did that off and on um when he first moved back to springfield after he you know had everything go down in florida he uh, worked some odd jobs and everything but yeah it wasn't long before he was driving a truck again because i mean you just you can make a lot of money that way (laughs) yeah for sure yeah oh yeah that makes me sad and again i know like i from what i've pieced together from various conversations i know that rod got crazy there I don't know. I think Rod always was. Um, you know, I talked to him a time or two. He was always really cool to me. He was nice and friendly. But I mean, yeah, it's him and Skip are um, some characters. We would just say that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but he was always just really genuinely nice to me. Like he yeah. would send me tapes and stuff. Of, like he was huge in the, into the Stranglers. Oh, so yeah. He would talk about the Stranglers all the time and send me tapes and stuff. Yeah. And um we wrote like a like a lot like we would write long letters you know yeah um i don't even know how we became pen pals but it was before i knew mike i knew rod before i knew mike oh wow yeah so wow. we were friends See, like no early were... yeah early 90s wow before i even knew mike so yeah to hear that he, and again my interaction with him was all very normal yeah um, but so to hear like like i had pictures of him and everything like he sent me pictures mm-hmm. and cassettes and you know, all this stuff but um to hear that that he kind of i guess lost it i don't know yeah. um that's sad to me yeah i mean i yeah i don't know i heard a lot of different stories about rod but yeah i, I think ultimately he just wound up dying of a heart attack or something like yeah. that yeah it was crazy 
but uh yeah well and then um you know richard christie or whatever i know mm -hmm. that he had skip on howard stern one time yeah and because i i remember being excited about that yeah and i listened to it and i'm like skip seemed relatively normal when he was yeah. on there i don't well, think yeah. howard i don't think howard got it you know what i mean uh, yeah well i mean yeah richard's from here too yeah yeah so like richard played drums in uh this death metal band locally called public assassin and public mm -hmm. assassin was one of the first things that got me into local music i was too young to go to their shows but i would go to that same record store that i was telling you about yeah. and i'd buy the demos there so i would listen to them at home and they had this great album called raw as fuck and it was literally just this red because like this red like construction paper looking cover had their logo and just raw as fuck in giant letters and what 12 year old doesn't want to go home with that right? right yeah so i really got into that and um richard put out a movie and it was called evil ned three apparently there was two others but i never saw the first two but he actually put it on vhs and sold it there at the mad platter and it's richard being goofy and everything and it's just it it's pretty hard to watch if you don't know the people <laughs> right right fun. like you don't get it right yeah yeah but me i ate it up and the one thing i noticed was like hey they keep like all these shots are shot right outside of this one place i know where that's at it's this place downtown so me and my friend chris we decide on a friday night my mom was dating at the time so she wasn't home a lot so on the weekends you know i'd have my friend chris to sleep over and we yeah. just leave right yeah. so we walk sure. downtown we found where that place was i'm like okay so we're just gonna set out here and wait till somebody comes outside <laughs> And so eventually this guy comes out and I say, Hey, is Richard there? And the guy's like, who are you? I'm like, well, I'm John's friend. You know, I was like, cause I was writing John O at the time yeah. and John knew all those guys. And he goes, yeah. wait a minute. Cause you know, they also had this band called Pisser where they just, it was just a bunch of drunk guys doing bad covers and pissing people off at clubs. That's hilarious. He, goes, he goes, wait a minute. Aren't you the guy that wrote the letter? I'm like, yeah. He goes, Oh, come in. So he, they drag me in and there's Richard and this whole crowd of people in this building. They're all watching interview with a vampire. And so, right on. yeah, so we hung out and watched the movie with him. And, you know, I kind of was, I dropped by there a couple of times, but this is right before he moved to Florida and joined death and the rest yeah. is history. So but, were you scared when you went in there? No, not really. I mean, no. it was like, I was just, I thought, all right, cool. We're in, you know? And I mean, it's, they, they were all awesome. cool with us. Yeah. I was always scared of everybody yeah it was um i don't know for me whenever i discovered the local scene it was it was so neat to me because you know i mean of course i was a music fan but yeah. i never had any idea of how somebody put a band together or anything like that and so discovering public assassin and then you know the local scene and then whenever i started writing john you know that uh like it was really neat so that's kind of what really uh gave me the courage to start recording my own music yeah yeah. I know it does kind of seem like this mythic thing. Yeah. Until you realize it's really not. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you know, you got to wonder like, what's that going to be like for your son, you know, or like my stepson right. where they grow up in a house where people are just doing that all the time, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think he's fairly numb to it. Like, I don't think he gets that it's different. Yeah. Um, and then we went to see Soft Kill um, when they were here a couple years ago. And it was at this outdoor burrito festival, which is, fantastic yeah. and so we got to take him with us because it was a fest like it was a street fair yeah and they gave him a shout out on stage and like he got to you know he got to experience like what it's like to hang out with the band and like right. they gave him vinyl and they uh. gave him all this stuff and so i think it kind of dawned on him then like okay this is like really kind of cool you know yeah um, but as far as we go, he's just like, uh, can you turn your guitar down? I'm trying to like play Minecraft or whatever, <laughs> you know, but it's That's so good. funny. It's like, he's got, he, he's got like, you know, he gets credits on the album cause he's on a couple of the albums and yeah. I'm like, dude, you're on Wikipedia. Like you're nine. <laughs> You've yeah. been on Wikipedia since you were like five or something. It's just funny to me. But, That's um, nice. At some point that'll probably mean more to him than it does now, but right. Yeah. Like I still get, I still think it's cool that I'm on, um, I have some, somebody put up a profile of me on some like metal, um, 
metal archives oh yeah 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 what, encyclopedia like, mentalium or whatever yeah something yeah. like that i'm like holy shit i'm on like the metal like yeah it's just so funny to me because i'm literally like this hillbilly from you know yeah rural ohio that listened to like the cure you know <laughs> and uh it, you know now i'm like i've got a somebody built a profile on some metal archive yeah thing. they are um, they, they're really good about that. I don't know who, like, I think right. it's kind of like Wikipedia where a lot of different people would contribute to that. But I don't know if you saw it was around uh, on April Fool's Day. Somebody changed all the band pictures to cat pictures. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. And so, like, I, I found one of my own bands on there and, like, said, man, I really hope they don't fix this because it was yeah. just this really great looking, pissed off looking cat on the front yeah. of it. And so that's, that's way better funny. than our pictures. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, I didn't know about that, but yeah, that's cool. I don't yeah. know. It, it's, it's, um, it's cool. That kind of stuff's cool to me. Yeah. But yeah, so it's been really neat. But yeah, like whenever I met John and everything, talking to him and, uh, you know, and eventually meeting other people that played music in my area, it eventually, I finally got into my first band when I was about 15. And that was so exciting. You were for young me. though, but that's yeah. young. Yeah. I started playing guitar when I was 12 and, uh, you know, and all I did is just like learned a bunch of Metallica covers and stuff like that. And then a uh, big discussion great thing for me to discover was the Ramones and Loco Live, their live album from 93. I would listen to that all the time. And then once I realized, okay, if you can play a power chord, if mm -hmm. you can move it around enough to match it, you can play every song on this album because that's all they play, you know? Yeah. So I got to where I could play relatively quick doing that. And then of course, Slayer definitely makes it to where you can play faster. Yeah. But uh, so I started playing with other musicians and everything and just you know, I was in a lot of different bands over the years, but never got to tour doing that fun stuff. I got to open for a few decent sized bands locally, but it wasn't exactly pay to play. But what the promoters would do would be like, OK, well, collectively, this band needs to sell this many tickets at this oh, show. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'll never do that crap again. Yeah, that's lame. <laughs> yeah, it was super lame. Yeah. I remember uh, this I band. Would... How would you even do that? I don't even know how you yeah. do that. Well, with this band I was in in the early aughts or whatever, um, we got to open for Soulfly. Now, opening for Soulfly in, say, like, 1996, or, or I guess they came out about 98 or so, they were kind of a big deal there for a minute. But in about 2003 or so, most people weren't really listening to them. And yeah. I remember the promoters like, okay, we're going to have a lot of people here. Is this going to be a big show? I'm like, I want to say, yeah, maybe it was five years ago. I barely <laughs> sold the six tickets I was given to sell. Yeah. So I guess we'll see if there's anybody here tonight. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah thankfully so. we never had to do that no yeah you guys got good to get in on a good tour but at the same time i was never at a show where everybody wanted to crucify me so <laughs> Yeah. yeah i imagine facing off like being the opening band when everybody's out there to see typo must have been rough yeah because prior to that like we only ever did our shows so right I mean, that's not like we think we're cool, but that's just how yeah. it worked out, you know? Right. Um, so it was weird to go. And, you know, the worst goths are going to do is talk. Yeah. They're not going to, like, true. throw a bottle at you. Typically. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was um, definitely uh, eye-opening. Like, the, fir the first night was, what was it? Uh, New London, Connecticut was our first show with them. And it was just Mike and I. Yeah. And because uh, Dave had um, essentially left the band at that point. So we show up and like Electric Hellfire Club is also opening, mm -hmm. who we had been warned about. Yeah. So somebody, because apparently Thomas had a beef with Sam at Project. And so they told us like, stay away from him. He's, he's violent and blah, blah, blah. Nicest people on the planet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they were so nice to us, like lovely people that it was fine. Um, but yeah, we, we played the show and it was like, holy crap. Like people are yelling, they're throwing stuff at us. Um, it was ugly. Yeah. And, and so the next night I believe, but it was okay. Like it wasn't crazy. 
It was, it yeah. was doable. It wasn't like your ego hurts a little bit, but you didn't feel like threatened. Like your life was in danger. Right. Following the night was Syracuse. And let me tell you, that was freaking scary. So <laughs> it, there was a ton of like skinheads there. Oh man. And there was one little girl wearing a Lycia shirt standing right in the sea of this angry testosterone. Yeah. And I honed in on her because I'm like, yeah. you're my you're my girl. <laughs> it was it they were throwing stuff at us, they were spitting on us. I watched security drag one guy to the side of the stage, beat the shit out of him and throw him out the door. Like it oh, was man. Mike, Mike is like standing in front of his rack, like guarding it from it getting hit. Cause we can't afford to replace these yeah. racks if, you know, if our stuff gets destroyed or whatever. And Peter, after the shows, he would just be like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so, and we're like, no, no, dude, it's okay. It's fine. But yeah. we had actually cut our set down. We were only playing four songs. We're like, we're wow. only playing four songs. I think it was like 20 minutes. We're playing our four songs and getting the hell off the stage. Like <laughs> before we get our asses beat. So yeah. we were like real iffy about it. And then um, I think Boston was next and Boston was a pretty good show. Um, Cause there was a lot of Lycia people in Boston. So they came to the show also. So that was okay. And uh, Poughkeepsie was great. Um, that was actually a really nice show. And it was the first show that the Misfits played. It was like their secret oh, yeah. practice warm-up show for Roseland Ballroom in New York. And of course, that show was fantastic, like Roseland Ballroom. Yeah. Who would think that we would be standing on, you know, on stage at Roseland Ballroom? Right. It was just, it was, the sound was perfect. The crowd was great. Like it wasn't, they weren't yelling, I hate you please yeah. die <laughs> <laughs> but we were so like shell-shocked by the whole thing that we like planned our set and then left like we didn't even stay and like in retrospect i'm like i hope peter didn't think we were like like we thought we were too cool to like hang out it's like no we're literally licking our wounds and going back to the <laughs> hotel to like decompress from feeling like we're going to be killed but yeah it was it was um it was pretty crazy yeah. But again, it was um, a great experience and it led to people being converted to listen yeah. to, you know, different kinds of music. And, and again, now like a huge chunk of the people that support us come from that, yeah. from, from Peter. So yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. <laughs> so do you all know like Michael Plaster very well or anything? I wouldn't say I know him well, but yeah. um, for sure I've, we've hung out with him and stuff like yeah. more Mike more than me because um, uh, they hung out more like before I joined the band because Mike lived here and everything and yeah, uh, they had mutual friends together and Mike used to live with a guy that was in a band with them and blah, 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 blah. Um, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. He still but, lives here. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen him in a long time, but yeah, man, I love the soul whirling somewhere albums, but it was like one of those things like, um, hope was to me when I like listened to that and like, you know, read through it all. It's like, this is like the it's most, it's in a very intense breakup album. Yeah. And it's like, I thought like, okay, I guess maybe I'm kind of glad there's not more of those albums because if yeah. a guy had to go through that every time he made an album, I, yeah. I, I don't think, yeah. Did you ever see a mighty wind? The, no. Okay. Well, there's this great <laughs> Eugene Levy's in that. And um, the whole thing it's about, it's the same people that made this a spinal tap. It's Christopher guest and that whole okay. crowd, but it's all about these uh, bluegrass musicians. Oh, cool. Okay. And so Eugene Levy plays this kind of like, artsy guy who's went through a bad breakup and they start showing this succession of albums of his and he looks really sad on one and the next one he looks a little worse and the third one he's like standing in a grave digging it <laughs> and that kind of reminds me that that seems like where those albums were going but yeah. at the same time i love those soul whirling somewhere albums i yeah. just they're uh, yeah it's the prime example of what we were talking about earlier of like listening to music that you just want to die to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so beautiful and his voice is so pretty and yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, but at the he's, same, a, he's a great guy. 
Yeah. I mean, it's just like, there was definitely like, just it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, I've never heard an album that quite captured the feeling of heartbreak like that yeah. one did, you know? So yeah. I was always curious about that. He did, I think some guest vocals on that last black tape for a blue girl album. So yeah, I think he did. I don't really yeah. listen to black tapes. So I don't really know what goes on over there, but I know that like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. I think, and Mike did a little bit of guitar on That's cool. one of the songs. Yeah. Uh, I think, I want to say it's, I think it was the last song. In the, I don't remember though. Yeah. I think he did a little bit of guitar for it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't really know much about Black Tape, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really either. I listened to that last one. I thought, oh, hey, that's the Soul Whirling Somewhere guy. I could tell from yeah. his voice, you know? But, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was really not, cool. it, it, and again this is not whatever but it's just not my cup of tea like that's yeah i gotcha no offense to anybody but it's just <laughs> right thing. Yeah. and in fact it's funny because when i got my ionia cassette from my pen pal that sent it to me mm -hmm. back in the day <laughs> he sent me lycia and he sent me black tape and i popped the black tape in and i'm like okay this is whatever this is nice and I took it out and I didn't even listen to the whole thing. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a dick. Right. But I was just, I wanted to check them out to see what yeah. they sounded like. So I popped that in, listened to a, couple, like a little bit of it, popped it out, put the Ionia in. And as soon as it kicked in, I was yeah. like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and immediately started writing my friend back. Who is this? Where do they live? I need their address, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it was right. funny. That's, that's what did it for me. But, but again, Lycia has that same thing to me that like Godflesh has mm -hmm. where it's like this kind of gut punch you know yeah and I'm not talking about my Lycia I'm talking about right. Mike like because I don't yeah. talk about myself like that that's ridiculous but yeah. like it just has this like kick in the heart or something I don't know but just yeah, yeah I heard that record and I was just like I need to know this person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then like a start corner, I can't listen to Dan the start corner without crying. Like, I don't know what it is about that record that just like triggers me every time. Yeah. I can't, I can't listen to it without crying. And, um, uh, so I don't listen to it hardly ever because it, I have to be in that mood to want to feel that way in order to, go down yeah. that road you know there's a couple right. record there's a couple albums in you know in in your life that have such strong emotional things that you know you have to be in the right mindset to listen to it yep. otherwise it's going to either wreck your day or you're just not going to vibe with it or whatever but yeah, yeah. Star corner is one of those for me it's so good again you know, and, I, and again and i'm like how did you do this right because it's like like i hear like wide open spaces and I'm like, this is like, like Ravel or something. Like, this is a classical piece of music. Where did this come from? How did you do this? Yeah. You know? And of course, he's probably in the other room hearing this cringing, like, because <laughs> he's this, he's, he's his yeah. worst enemy. But yeah, yeah, I'm just like, where does this come from? Right. How do people write like that? I don't know. Yeah, I know it was, um, I think maybe a year or two ago where you just posted a picture of the apartment you all lived at and like it said something about this is where we recorded cold and it just yeah. blew me away because me when I listened to that I'm like I just assumed you recorded it in the forest in the middle of winter <laughs> because I mean right. that's the feeling I got from yeah. it. And yeah. it was a, uh, that was an album like seriously, you know, um, up until recently, I used to go for a lot of long runs in the middle of the night. I was working overnight. And so when I'd have a night off, that's one of the ways I'd kill time is I just go for long runs. And, oh, that's well, awesome. Yeah. Well, lately my knee's been acting up, so I don't go quite as long yeah. as I'd like to. But that album is one I'd go out there at night, put cold on and just run. And that was just a perfect album for that. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's not so much the pacing, it's the vibe, you know, it's just, mm. it puts me in the right mindset to be outside at night. And That's I live cool. right. Yeah. I live right on the outskirts of town. So there's a lot of woods and stuff around me. So it's, That's it's cool. a good album for working out in the middle of the night. <laughs> well, we did have a huge field and a huge woods right behind our apartment. And we were on the third floor with our balcony facing it. Yeah. And at the time, 
the studio was all set up in the living room. So the living room was just studio. So right. technically we were in the woods, but yeah. we're just in this like normal, you know, normal apartment or whatever. And it was a very, very cold winter. Like we had a lot of blizzards and none of us, you know, us and Dave, we weren't getting along. We all lived in the same house. So there was like this icy vibe in the house too. Like, we don't talk to you. You don't talk to us. We don't look at you. You don't look at us. <laughs> Mike would go knock on the door. Dave, it's time to record. Dave would crawl out of bed. You know, <laughs> the, and, and this is, this, this was how it was. So it was like this really cold atmosphere, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, I, I, you know, the album got made. Yeah. Uh, but it was a lot of Mike, Dave, it's time to record. Come <laughs> do your parts. Yeah. No, push that button. Oh, wow. It was very, very, um, yeah. 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 And did you all do that with a four track or was it digital? Uh, he had an eight track, I want to say, but it was okay. dying. So, you yeah. know, uh, the song later, you can hear it bending. Yeah. That's not on purpose. Oh, wow. That's the sound of his machine actually dying. <laughs> Happy accident, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know. I'm like, I think, I'm like, I love that. I think it sounds cool. But yeah, that's that wasn't on purpose. That was the machine dying. Wow. He had that's like pretty... mold growing. Like it was his his machine was like, there was mold growing in it. And just like, it was, <laughs> it was dying, basically. Yeah. But, yeah. I know a lot of people are all about like analog recording. I'm like, that's because you didn't have that as an only option. You know, it's like, you don't yeah. understand how great digital is. Yeah, <laughs> where you have infinite tracks. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. can just keep recording over and over and over and over. Right. And there's no problems with it. Yeah. Yeah. And you can like pinpoint that one spot and cut yes. it right where it needs to be done. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, analog, I guess it's fine for the warmth and all that, but I don't miss my four track at all. Guess what? You can put some effects on there to add that warmth if you want it. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> there's there's probably a, you know, an app for that or something. I don't know. Yeah. So, like, let's see, I have been to Ohio. I went to Strongsville a handful of years ago. Okay. To, uh, went to a um, horror convention out there they do called Cinema Wasteland. Are you mm. familiar with that at all? No. And I'm it's, not sure where Strongsville is. I know the name, but I'm not sure where that is in relation to where I grew up. It's about 15. Sure. I think it's about 15 minutes outside of Cleveland. Okay. Yeah. yeah so not far. Yeah, so I went out there for that, and that was pretty neat. Um, met a bunch of friends out there, and uh, but it's just where it's kind of like just Comic Con, but it's all just horror, you know. It's oh, you go out there, fun. yeah. So a lot of movies, and some of the people come who've been in movies come out yeah. there. And when I was out there, some of the cast from Night of the Living Dead were there, so oh, it was pretty cool. neat. That's yeah, cool. so they had like a little panel where they'd ask questions and all that. Yeah. But, but it was neat like you know i'm not used to being around just like i don't know just a whole bunch of people all together for one thing that's not a concert <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah i always want to go to those things and we just haven't done it yet because there's a few here in phoenix yeah i think there's a horror convention here and then of course like a, a comic-con it's like a comic book one right and we've just never gotten around to doing it yet but i want to i want to start doing those um like go and get a table and like sell books and stuff i think that would be fun yeah, sort of like touring minus the actual having to play shows part of it <laughs> just go and hang out and talk to people yeah that was kind of the reason i was there at the time um one of the guys who i've been playing music with for the last few years uh, billy nocera he has a label called Razorback Records, and they were out there selling a bunch of their stuff at the time. And so cool. we'd been like working together online, but we never actually met face to face. So yeah. I went out there to like go meet him and everything and hang out and uh, a couple of the other people that I'd been talking to online. So well, that was pretty cool. I love that. And isn't it funny how like literally at this point you can work with anybody in the entire world? Yeah, it's, it's um, so cool. <laughs> Yeah, the one thing I have said about it, though, it's like, it's so easy to find people that are into exactly what you're into. And so you can kind of already have a direction planned out. 
Whereas with the band I play here in town, this is more, it's like, it's just about like, hey, I know you, you play music, we live in the same town, let's get together, yeah. and therefore, there's a lot of compromise, but therefore, a lot more, like, I think you, you can get more creative that way, because you're having to, like, yeah. you know, cater to other people's that. interest and everything else. Yeah. I could see that, yeah, because they're bringing a different angle than what you, like, if you were choosing a, a piece yeah you wouldn't necessarily choose that piece but they're bringing it so you got to work off of it kind of thing yeah yeah yeah, it's like the guys i'm playing with now it's like our bass player he's a this is a band called misery stairs that we do here in town and our bass player he's like a real musician he's one of those guys that can like talk to you about theory and stuff yeah. like that and everything so that's a little intimidating for me because i've always kind of always played by ear yeah. and our drummer i actually played with him years ago when i was about 15 and everything so we know each other from that whole scene and then our singer is about 12 years younger than us so she's oh, like this wow. yeah she's a nice bridge between our generation and the one coming up so it's kind of yeah. nice you know yeah. But yeah so i've been playing oh, with them cool. for a minute yeah but uh i figured i should mention something about them since like you know a few people may watch this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, and yeah. also after this is done, make sure you send me links to any anything that you yeah, want. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff, yeah. But, yeah, we've got yeah. some stuff on Bandcamp, and I think we have an album on Spotify too. So cool. there's that. And then I've got this other. <laughs> this is my um, obnoxious metal project. This is a band called uh, Headless Eyes, and this is our album Horripilations, which you can uh, buy at Razorback Records now. It's got a nice little layout That's and everything. Cool. Yeah. yeah cool 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 but it's just like a bunch of uh obnoxious metal songs inspired by <laughs> horror movies so yeah, if you well, like i know a lot of thing. people that like that yeah so yeah maybe right on <laughs> that's cool yeah so like um you said you were in bands before like see uh, in ohio like what kind yeah. of stuff did you all do so my first band, what were we called? My first band was called Hordes of Babylon. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and we just did like, I don't even know how to describe it. Sort of like, um, I don't even know, like uh, punk. Yeah. <laughs> goth metal i don't yeah. i don't know what it, it was weird the bass player sort of played like funky sort of yeah the guitar player was a metal guitar player but he could like play any kind of style or whatever nice. i don't even know and i like did weird vocals yeah that sounded like a five-year-old throwing a temper tantrum so did y'all ever should, record yeah 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 there's some <laughs> songs we should have i should upload them at some point yeah but then cool. after the um bass player left we changed the name to children of god yeah and it was the same sort of vibe but uh my song pink fingers um and little blue cherry girl off my first solo record okay. were re reworked versions of songs from those bands so you can sort of get a little bit of an idea what we sounded like yeah. Um, except for that, uh, there's just, they're all electronic on, I don't think there's any guitar on those songs on the record. Um, yeah. but they originally had guitar and bass on them. Oh, um, cool. but you can sort of get a vibe. I should totally upload that. I just actually ran across the CD of that the other day. I yeah. should, um, I should upload them someplace. Yeah. So I, uh, don't get along with one of the old members at this point and I can see uh, him throwing a fit. So I probably won't, but, um, yeah. Yeah. No, like I go through like, you know, my old demos and stuff like that. And I always say, it's like, well, I'm never ashamed of anything I did. Yeah. You know, it's like stuff I did. And, but then like, I've got all these old tapes, like, oh man, I really need to digitize all this. And then I'll put it in the tape deck and listen to it. I'm like, yeah, not today. <laughs> so cringe. I don't, it's funny because I think, I think what it is, like when I listen to it, like I cringe so hard, but it's because I can hear how young I was. Right. You know, like not getting getting it kind of like i got yeah. it i got it in the way i got it but like it's just so young and it's so like like oh look at you you're so cute 
Yeah. Oh, you're in a band. You're so <laughs> cute. Yeah. But it's so funny because like I sent those tapes all over the place. Like we would find labels and like put these shitty cassettes in there. And like, we would put random stuff in there. Like I would just pick stuff up off the floor in my room, like broken crayons, <laughs> cards, like random weird stuff in there and like write the letter in like crayon and be like, we're so-and-so. And like, yeah. we would always get responses back, which was what was funny. And yeah. I remember the one guy, I can't remember which label it was now, but it was a known label like an underground label, but they had a name. I remember the guy writing me back and he was like, this sort of reminds me of the dead Kennedys. And I'm like, okay. Nice. <laughs> that's not negative. That's positive. Yeah. But it was just really, you know, and like I said, at the same time I was sending Mike, cause I just had started talking to Mike and I'm like, I'm in a band. And I would send him these tapes and like how he gleaned anything good out of there. I don't know. I'm not dissing my co- bandmates they right. were all good performers or whatever but yeah and he was just like oh yeah you sing come sing you do you want to sing on these songs and it was my burning circle song so whatever yeah. i think it was more of an excuse for us to just meet or whatever but yeah um how funny though yeah yeah i used to send those they're, they're i'm sure everybody that they've long since been thrown in a dumpster someplace but right theoretically somebody could have those tapes out there <laughs> Yeah, I remember taking like um, some of my solo stuff that I did when I got my first four track and I actually like I used to have a rejection letter from Nuclear Blast. I was just proud like, oh, my God, somebody actually mailed me Wrote back. Me back. I yeah, know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's probably just, you know, a, a hand a, a typed letter that they sent out to everybody. Right. But Still, it was hey, neat. exactly. They wasted 25 cents on you. There you go. <laughs> yeah. How funny, though. Uh, I should get those tapes out and listen. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, yeah. When are you talking about the dead Kennedys? I don't know who it was. You had somebody on your podcast a few episodes back that had that great bit about, I guess, how he had lived next door to jail of Biafra. And he was talking yeah, about, yeah, yeah, yeah. but Seen about him at being, the grocery store. Yeah. It's like, oh my yeah. God, beans are so damn expensive. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> he did a great impersonation, though. That was, that was awesome. Yeah, that was I, funny. Yeah. I had to send that clip to my stepson. He's a big Aww. Dead Kennedys fan. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. You were talking about like when you went and um, hung out in front of that building and like met mm -hmm. Richard and all that stuff. So I grew up near Kent, Ohio. Okay. So we hung out in Kent all the time because that's where all the cool kids were, right? Yeah. And being like little 15-year-old me, wannabe goth kid, or not even a goth kid. I didn't know what goth was. You were a Cure fan. You were a yeah. Susie fan. Whatever that was at the time. You didn't call it right. anything. And so me and my friends would like cruise Kent. You know, you just drive your car and look for all the punk rockers because there was a lot of them there because the college was there. Right. And plus, because Kent was like a known music scene, I mean, like Devo came from there, you know, yeah. all this stuff. And there was this building there um, and there was like an art gallery that, that they would have punk shows in there called the Mantis. And so yeah. that was where the really cool people hung out because yeah. it was like really underground and like all the underground punk kids. And like, so me and my little, you know, other 15 year old cohorts, we would walk by there, you know, and just be so like intimidated by it. Like, oh, there's the really cool, like hardcore punk kids. And, and of course they were all in college already. So they were like adults, yeah. you know? <laughs> and I remember the first time we mustered the courage to actually go into this Mantis and watch the show. Cause one of this really super cool, cute boy, punk, hardcore punk kid was like, you going to the show tonight? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> we were we had we hadn't planned on doing it but he asked us if we were going so we were gonna go and um we went in there and this band called the bloody liver rot was playing and it, it, it was like this oh my gosh we're like with the really cool kids so like you were saying like you weren't scared i'm like i was like nervous because uh -huh. you know you have you have these perceptions of like these people are like, you know, dark and doing drugs and like all this <laughs> stuff. And I'm just like this little, you know, kid from out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. 
you know so it was like it was like we're here this is cool this is so cool <laughs> such a nerd but yeah that that band was cool they were cool yeah. and then there was another band called flat black that was around there and the guy that that i think i think the guy that ran that band owned that building so they played a lot they played a lot there um but they all knew like devo and Oh, wow. The guys all went to college there, and yeah. there was a club right directly across the street from there called JV's Down Under, which Devo used to film. Like Mike just told me this the other day. Devo filmed a lot of their early videos in that club. So, oh, like, wow. we used to go in there. Do you remember a band called Dink? Yeah, I, I remember, like, weren't they the ones that had, like, the fish on their album or something? Like, I remember their something logos. Something like that, Kind of yeah. like a crude hand-drawn. Something yeah. like that. But they, yeah. they um, filmed their video that was on Beavis and Butthead. Like, oh, that's, nice. I think that's kind of how they got big. They had a video on Beavis and Butthead or whatever. But they used to play in there, too. So there was all these, like, bands. Um, there was just such a cool scene in Kent. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of like my 80s, 90s, early, yeah. eight, mid to late 80s, very early 90s, was tooling around in Kent looking for all the cool, yeah, the cool kids, you know, and like, that's kind of how you learned about music. Like yeah. you were saying, like, you didn't have access to it. So like these right. kids in these movies that are like 15, and they've got the best taste ever in music. And you're like, yeah, it's not how it works. Yeah. You have to meet somebody who knows something that's right. how you learn about stuff but yeah, yeah like hanging out in kent and stuff and we we would just my i would send i, I was always the sh sort of shy so i would send my friend shelby who wasn't shy send yeah. her over to meet the cool people so we'd be like "Ooh, see that boy over there let's we want to meet him you go talk to him so we would send her over and she would just be like hey what's up and then drag him over and but like that's how you learned about like Right. They would start talking about music. Have you ever heard of this band? No, I've never heard of that band. And then that's how you learned, you know? Yeah. It's just now kids are spoiled, man. You just go on the internet and you could find, go on Spotify, some yeah. curated, you know, so it's fantastic because everything's just right there. Well, nowadays yeah. too, my stepson will be like sending me links to stuff that, you know, came out way, you know, that I should have known about right? <laughs> you know? or like I, you know, heard about and didn't check out at the time and things like yeah. that. So that's really cool to have that now, well, but I know. And, well, and also not to cut you off, but like one of my friends who's my age has a teenage daughter and son and like they're all listening to the music that he was listening to when he was their age and like it's all new to them because they've never heard it before yeah. but i'm like your daughter's way effing cooler than i have ever been in my entire <laughs> life like she knows everything about music from back in the day that i wasn't listening to and i'm just like your yeah. kids are way cooler than i'll ever be but anyways yeah. I think well, something that's cool too. It's like I don't really see kids just necessarily zeroing in on one genre now. Right. It yeah. seems like their tastes are much more varied. They'll listen yeah. to yeah anything. And my bass player was talking about that recently. Like you know he works at the local library and he said that these kids would just be like listening to like some kind of mumble rap and then yeah. followed up with like you know the moody blues or something. Yeah. This is like what the hell are you kids into? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Just yeah. Like, but that's better, really. I mean, absolutely well-rounded it's so much yeah. fun you should be able to find lots and lots of things that you like like you right. should yeah i think no, that's I cool yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it for me, because when I was younger, I went through a phase where like, no, I, I listened to this and this is what I listened to. For and sure. basically it was just lying to myself because I knew I liked all this other stuff. I just wouldn't admit it because I had a reputation to uphold. Right. But, you had you an know. image there you had to protect. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. yeah, at some point we, we as humans should like grow out of that. Like again, like I said, was talking about earlier, when you're young, it's like you feel like you need to identify as something so bad. Right. And then the older you get, I feel like most people are just kind of like, eh, I don't care anymore. Like, I like what I like. I don't need to fit in. Yeah. I don't need to be like a part of some scene or whatever. You just are who you are. Yeah. And that's all. 
And one I don't like, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, this is my guilty pleasure. It's like, I don't know. I think once you reach the age of 30, guilty pleasure shouldn't be anything you have. It should just be it like, this is what guilt, I like. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're into some really sick stuff. Yeah. Then you should yeah. feel guilty. If it's just music, you should feel guilty. <laughs> I feel the exact same way. It's like some people will like, like, I know I shouldn't like, you know, real housewives of whatever. It's like, you like what you like. Like, you yeah. don't have to make excuses for it. It's like clearly it there's a market for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Otherwise You're not the show the wouldn't exist. Yeah. It. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't get that either. Like you just like what you like. Like I like some stuff that's like high art, and I like garbage. Mm. Like yeah, for sure. <laughs> sometimes you don't want to be deep and you know yeah. sit around and feel sorry for yourself. You just want to watch Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> you know, yeah. I fucking love that show. Yeah, I definitely like all the memes of Gordon Ramsay yelling at yeah. people for different it's things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love him. Yeah, yeah, I love him. I like the the idiot sandwich meme. I yeah. think is my favorite one. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm like someday at some point in my life I will go to one of his restaurants. That's like on the bucket list. He had that one show where it was with the kids, and I thought it was cool. Yeah. But I thought. I was kind of hoping it'd be like more just Gordon Ramsay yelling at a bunch of kids, <laughs> but it wasn't that at all. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely not mean to kids. Yeah. yeah, he's a little easier on them. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, it's funny because I actually just read an article because you know everybody has this perception that he just stands around yelling at people all the time. Yeah. And um, his sous chef Christina, the the girl that's like the sous chef on Hell's Kitchen who I think she usually is uh, the sous chef for the red team. Um, she was talking about him and she's like, what you don't see is the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of him actually mentoring these people where right. he's like teaching them and coaching them and encouraging them and all that stuff. And she's like, if you notice, he never yells at anybody during like the challenges. He's always laughing yeah. and having a good time. He only yells at people when they're trying to send shitty food out to customers. That's the only time he throws a fit is during dinner service when you're charging people money for <laughs> shitty food. Like that's the right. only time. And she's like, pay attention. He doesn't ever yell at anybody besides when they're trying to put out bad food to customers. All right. Like raw chicken that you're going to kill somebody. I mean, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i'm like oh yeah yeah that's true like once i i'm like yeah he never does he's never like yells at anybody otherwise he might make fun of them or make you know like say this is crappy or whatever but he's not like yeah screaming and ho like throwing a piece of salmon at him or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well that doesn't give you ratings you know yeah. like you gotta yeah, have that boring. great yeah you gotta have the great bite you can show on a commercial break yeah. but... i love him though Oh my yeah. gosh. But yeah, I like all kinds of crap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you gotta have- I love nice... soap operas. Yeah. I watch a lot of animated shows, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's my main thing. But uh, So what's yeah. your animated shows that you watch? My go-to here lately, like I always put on King of the Hill, usually if I'm getting ready to go to bed, that is my go-to. That's yeah. what we've been watching. Okay, so Bob's Burgers- Mm -hmm. and we like we were telling Dirk for years watch Bob's Burgers it's great and he was resistant to it yeah. finally he watched it and like obsessed that's how we watched and yeah. then we just started with King of the Hill not too long ago too that's what we've been watching every single night yeah. for the last two weeks yeah as um, I've heard that they're actually going to resurrect King of the Hill like it's gonna happen yes and they're so supposed to be 10 years into the future so like Bobby will be an adult and yeah that's yeah, gonna... I can't wait. Yeah, and I know uh, Mike Judge is like they're cranking out a Beavis and Butthead movie for uh, the Paramount Channel, so right I'm really excited about that because I was yeah. a huge Beavis and Butthead fan yes. too. I just basically love just about anything Mike Judge does. Yeah, it's... he's great. He's, yeah. It's so relatable. It's so yeah. like you watch King of the Hill, and I'm like, I literally know all these guys. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they're not Texans, but they're you yeah. know the same stereotypes exist yeah everywhere for yeah. sure it's so but, cool though like oh my god we watched the episode last night you're gonna know what i'm talking about lenore 
oh, where yeah, Bill yeah. starts dressing like his ex. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Where Hank finally has to put on the dress and talk yeah. to him to gain to come down. That's a great yeah. one. And the <laughs> one where Bobby eats all the lutefisk and burns the church down. <laughs> yes, that's a good one. I think one yeah. of my favorite ones is the one where a uh, Boomhauer falls asleep on the inner tube and like winds up like washing ashore like in this city somewhere. But he's wearing like these. <laughs> leopard print briefs and he comes out and he's talking like yes yeah, so they think he's yeah. some kind of primitive man that came <laughs> up and he winds up in an asylum it's it's pretty great i just love that and you know another the, the funny one of the funniest parts of it to me too is that um john red john red red corn is it red yeah red corn yeah, yeah. <laughs> how is she him and his, his and and um i can't i'm like losing my brain it happens <laughs> what's his name uh what's dale dale yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's constantly just like blatant about the fact that he's nailing his wife yeah and, and dale's just like none the wiser yeah his son well, some... looks exactly like john right. redcorn <laughs> yeah well something like that... identical yeah, something that I noticed about King of the Hill, too, is that, you know, a lot of shows, these things that they become iconic for take place over time. They yeah. laid all that out in the oh, first yeah. episode with like John Redcorn popping out the window and everything. And yeah, it was just yeah. that they had an idea and they ran with it. Yes, it was fantastic. I love that one where um, the one. But John Redcorn comes to pick Nancy up, and, and his, when he turns his Jeep on, it's like, feel like making love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, he's always got, like, so rat good. or bad company or something playing <laughs> yeah. through a stereo. It's great. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So so that'll be interesting. Will, will Joseph ever put two and two together? Maybe we'll find out in the, um, yeah. the sequel or whatever you want to call it. The new, right. The new episodes. If he yeah. puts, does the math and figures it out. So you're talking about Bob's Burgers. Did you ever see a show called Home Movies that no. John Benjamin used to do? This Okay, so the first thing that I think John Benjamin did was he was um, the son, Benjamin, on Dr. Katz. Did you ever watch that show at all? No. So that originally came out on HBO, and then eventually I think it went over to Comedy Central. But what it was was um, I think the guy's name is Jonathan Katz. He's a comedian, and he would play a therapist, and these actual comedians would come on, and part of their therapy, what they're telling, their stories, it's actually their real comedy bits. Okay. And so that's a lot of fun. But then after that, John Benjamin was on a show called Home Movies, and Lauren Bacard, who also – help is one of the creators on bob's burgers he was part of that it was him and brendan small who made metalocalypse okay okay so home movies is all about basically this eight-year-old kid who's always trying to make movies you know and they're like really you know primitive and he just shoots him with a can like a little home camcorder but john benjamin plays his soccer coach and he's this big light guy who wears this big orange jumpsuit and his name is john mcgurk and <laughs> it's i have never seen a character that embodies john benjamin's voice better than that character i'll send you some clips after yeah, this it's that show is hilarious. I've got I've the never entire. Heard of that. It only ran for four seasons. It started on UPN and then it went over to Adult Swim when that first started. Okay. But um, yeah, I think it ran from like '99 to about 2004. Cool. I can't, I can't like I don't want Dirk to grow up because I want him to stay little. But yeah. I'm also excited about when he gets old enough to be able to watch. You know some of this stuff because like you know bob's burgers sometimes is a little like he doesn't get the references sometimes right. uh same thing with like king of the hill there's references he doesn't get thankfully yeah. but um you know i can't let him watch metalocalypse yet yeah that, that shows a little bonkers <laughs> yeah but i can't like i'm excited to be able to watch like all that stuff and like horror like certain horror yeah. films, you know the classics with them and stuff yeah that's gonna be really fun um yeah doing all that because i mean metalocalypse is so freaking great it's so, yeah i don't know that musicians would get it though yeah i think what i really like about metal non-musicians i mean like right. people that don't play music anyway yeah. What I always liked about that was not so much because there's they're always doing these really over the top story arcs and everything, right, you know, this whole like 
that's yeah but when they would put them in really mundane situations like whenever <laughs> the, yeah or like whenever nathan's girlfriend <laughs> is calling him while he's at the band meeting and she's yes. yelling at him on the phone that stuff was hilarious yes yeah yes and like making him wear like pink sweaters and yes holding, holding her purse yeah or they show him trying to move that couch through the door by himself like you know feel free to give me a hand with this (laughs) (laughs) yeah i love it i love it so much yeah that That show show is so yeah it was so good like i I feel like i needed subtitles on it though yeah i could see that (laughs) yeah like it was hard it was hard to catch a lot of it yeah um Oh my God. It's so good though. Yeah. But yeah, I think if you, if you enjoy Bob's burgers and you like metal apocalypse, I think you'd love yeah, home movies. I'm sure. I'm yeah, sure. It's just definitely those two creative minds on a completely different level, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's a lot of fun. I love that show. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of like actual kid cartoons that are like that too. Like, I don't yeah. know if you saw uh, Apple and Onion. I did not. That one's really weird. It's yeah. very weird. And of course, the Adventure Time mm-hmm. and Clarence, that one's really weird. Yeah. And there's all of these, like, weirdly, all three of those, car- well, I don't know, I don't remember so much in Adventure Time, but Apple and Onion and um, especially Clarence, there's all these, like, Stanley Kubrick references, like oh, wow. Clockwork Orange and, like, The Shining and stuff. And um, just wacky yeah weird storylines and you're just like what the how is this a kid's show like i don't think well you know and actually teen titans go there's a ton of like references in there too to stuff that yeah you don't get unless you get you know right well, well, i, I think, love that stuff yeah i think it was like after about the early 90s when nickelodeon came out with the nicktoons and like ren and stimpy and on I think that's when a lot of cartoons got really good because yeah. they actually gave a crap about the writing on that. Yes. Because I do remember, you know, growing up, you know, there was some Hanna-Barbera stuff that was tolerable, but a lot of that stuff like He-Man and all that, it was just made to sell the toys. And it's so there was like, garbage. Yeah. yeah. So there wasn't a lot put in there, but like, yeah, I mean, you know, SpongeBob and all that stuff. It's great. I mean, yeah. those storylines are hilarious and well, and it's like, I think they realize, too, that parents have to watch this crap. Right. Yeah. So they probably, it would probably behoove them yeah. <laughs> to have writing that adults also like. Yeah. So, like, I never complain about watching cartoons with Dirk because they're good. Right. You know? Yeah. You know? And, like, I, you know, I'm not a comic book reader, but I love, like, DC Comics and, uh, and, and like all that stuff yeah. so like 90 percent of my knowledge is from cartoons but they're all canon so right like it's like legit knowledge of the characters or whatever but like these cartoons are so good and i'm like the 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 storylines on these are so complex that they could easily be a live action film you know yeah. the writing's really good the acting's really good and yeah. um, I mean, like the first one of the very first cartoons that Dirk got into was the Green Lantern cartoon. And that's how he got obsessed with Green Lantern. And he was like two years old. Yeah. And I, it just happened to be on the TV or whatever. This is when the, the series came out and he was immediately like into it. And so like I watched it because it's on and it's so good. Like that yeah. last episode, I was like bawling my eyes out <laughs> watching it and like depressed that that was it, that it got canceled and they weren't yeah. making any more. And like Young Justice, same thing. It's a great cartoon. Um, was totally bummed out that they quit making those, but I'm pretty sure, I think that they're making them again now. But yeah. like all those cartoons, like Batman, like if you remember how good the Batman animated series was. Oh, the was. one from the 90s? Yeah, it's so yeah. good. Mm-hmm. And I think they're redoing that one too, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I remember the art direction on that one was pretty impressive. Yeah, and the Superman one was the same people, and it's just as good too. But yeah. like all that stuff, like I, I love it. Like I could watch, I could just watch cartoons all the time. Like yeah, they're great. I really like the quirky, funny stuff. Did you ever watch yeah. Chowder at all? 
No, there's all these ones that I know yeah. I would like if I watched them. I just haven't watched them. It didn't last long, but um, my uh, stepson, he was about Dirk's age, about the time that that came out. So we were really into that and watched yeah. that. And I think a lot of that cast went on to do the World of Gumball. The, okay. Yeah. We like that one too. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of along wacky. the same lines as far as just the quirkiness. And I think some of the voice actors are on that. Yeah. But, chowder was a lot of fun yeah do you remember one called fish hooks yes i remember it but i don't know <laughs> that, that i ever saw so it. weird <laughs> that one was good too but yeah there's yeah. just all these cartoons that we would just have the tv on and just watch one after the next and i'm like these yeah. are entertaining like i have no desire to watch anything else it's totally yeah. fine i'll watch cartoons all day long yeah, we really liked a regular show. We liked that yes. one. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, that was our. Yeah, we watched yeah. Dirk. Or Mike and I watched that on our own. Yeah. Because Dirk sure. was just a baby, and then yeah. recently, <laughs> like I want to say, probably last winter, we're like again. He was resistant to watch it, but we finally convinced him to watch it, and we watched it like all in like yeah. a couple weeks or whatever. And again, that final episode. Me and Dirk both were bawling our eyes out, like, oh, it's so sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great show. It's so weird. Yeah. But, yeah. So, but yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there. And there yeah, is. I think cartoons just got a lot better in about for the sure. early 90s. I think, yeah. you know, for a, is what a, from what I've heard, John Chris Falusi is a very problematic person, but Ren and Stimpy really did change the landscape, I think, once that yeah, came out. No doubt. Yeah. I th- and I think Beavis and Butthead, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was, you know, when The Simpsons came out, because mm-hmm. I was about nine years old when they first went and made the actual series, that was just, I mean, it, you know i remember us not being able to wear like a bart simpson t-shirt at school it was controversial you know because he said hell or something like that because it was a it was a cartoon that was geared for adults and uh, now they're all over the place but you know but it's just yeah it's been a few years since that was controversial (laughs) yeah yeah for sure i know i remember uh yeah i think it was i think he said something about fire and then I think yeah. he said something about fire mm-hmm. and uh, of course saying damn too, yeah. I think that like people were thrown. It's like, well, okay. Technically all those bug bunny, those bugs, bunnies cartoons were made for adults. Those weren't made for kids. Right. Cause they used to put those before the movies, before, yeah. you know? So those yeah. really weren't made for kids either, but I don't know. There was a great Beavis and Butthead moment in the, um, you know, I, may have seen it back in the day and didn't think anything of it but as an adult it just cracks me up every time and it's a uh, butthead takes beavis to the hospital and he walks up to the desk and says is this the hospital and the guy goes you know he goes how can i help you he goes uh you can tell me if this is the damned hospital <laughs> <laughs> it puts me on the floor every time I yeah, see it. Yeah, because it's so, it's just so stupid. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, uh, Beavis and Butthead was great. Yeah. Well, it was great too because they were making fun of teenage metalheads, and the teenage yeah. metalheads were the ones who just loved it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of good music on there though too. Yeah. Like their taste yeah. was always right because the. Like the cool stuff they always genuinely thought was cool. And yeah. then the crappy stuff they always made fun of. So like their taste was actually good too. Right. Which was funny. And then remember Stuart with his winger shirt? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Kip Winger actually complained that Beavis and Butthead ruined Winger's career. It's like, nah, dude, people just your didn't like music Winger. ruined your career. <laughs> but how funny yeah kip winger actually played bass on a an alice cooper album i like a lot there's a raise your fist and yell that one came out in the late 80s but yeah he was touring with alice cooper for a while before he went solo pretty interesting stuff yeah Yeah. that is interesting (laughs) yeah Yeah, i don't know really anything about kip winger i just know that a couple years ago i went on this weird phase (laughs) of posting pictures of him all the time yeah <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, but I mean, it was they're... funny. 
in the 80s a lot of girls had pictures of kip winger everywhere. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. i wasn't one of them yeah <laughs> yeah that's funny yeah i i went on some weird like there's a couple things that people randomly will associate with me that really yeah. i don't know anything about right for a while it was kip winger danzig <laughs> i literally don't know anything about Dan- i know he's uh, I, mean, yeah. I know i know who he is obviously yeah. i know he was in the misfits i know he's in sawin i yeah. know the song mother right and that concludes my knowledge of danzig but people yeah. are constantly like tagging me on danzig stuff all the time because <laughs> i was always posting those memes and stuff yeah. and i think it's hilarious and then uh, billy squire oh uh, yeah the billy squire thing i do really genuinely like billy squire <laughs> i don't know a lot about him yeah. but i like i heard that like yeah he kind of like made one video or whatever that kind of it ruined his career yeah Yeah, he was taken seriously before that video came out and then like he even knew while they were doing it that it was bad but you're owned by the record label so i mean i think that's kind of what happened too like there for a while there whenever uh I think the labels did the same thing to Garth mm-hmm. Brooks when they made him do that whole Chris Gaines thing. Oh my thing. God, like, that's so cringe. Yeah, he, he wanted nothing to do with it, but, you know, label pressure. I feel like I would still just tell him to go fuck themselves. There's no yeah. way. Yeah. There's no way. No yeah, way. <laughs> There's right. no way. Yeah. It's so cringe. Um, I don't know if you watch a lot of YouTubers or whatever, but there's this, um, this girl I watch on there called Trailer Trash Tammy okay and she's associated with this other girl that i don't know what her name is on there but she goes by crystal so they have these characters that they play sort of and Uh, crystal is doing like music reviews and she did one of that chris gaines record the other day yeah and um mike and i worked at um an audio and film distributor in ohio uh, before we moved out here so it was like we worked there from like 98 to 98 99 to 2001 ish yeah and that's when that record came out oh, and wow. we used to just sit and just laugh our asses off it because like a bunch of musicians worked at this place yeah. and we would just like laugh at all this crap because it was so bad and so anyways i saw that girl did a review of that record um the other day and it just brought back all these memories of when we had like promotional posters for this and like all this stuff we were shipping out. And yeah. I went and I looked it up because I on, on the internet, I'm like, I gotta see this because this yeah. is, it was so cringe. Oh my God. Like, what were you thinking, dude? Yeah. What were you thinking? Like trying to be like, <laughs> like goth. I don't yeah. even, what were you do- Like, what were you trying to do? I don't even yeah it was like weird goth music or something but But, then you like his the image was like this weird like he was trying to be trent reznor or something but then you (laughs) listen to the music and the music is like sad boy like backstreet boys almost it's really weird it's really weird very confusing that sounds very bizarre yeah yeah but I know um, one of the things I've been meaning to go back and check out was whenever uh, I think it was Rob Halford had like teamed up with Trent Reznor and they did that two album. And I've always heard people say it's not half bad, but I've never listened to it. But I'm yeah. a huge Judas Priest fan. So and I mean, I like some industrial stuff, too. So I might actually yeah. dig it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of stuff people don't like and you're like, I don't know. I think it's OK. Yeah. I hear people now like and I feel like it's the oldies bitching about billy eilish like they're so mad that kids like billy eilish and i'm like have you listened to it because it's not bad like i don't no. know why i don't know why yeah. that irritates me so much what are they supposed to be listening to like right. yeah. music from our generation like when you were a kid did you listen to your grandfather's records like yeah probably not I think it's a, uh, you know, we, I talked about those some of my bandmates one time too. And it's like, it seems like a lot of this like generational, like, you know, guys our age complaining about the upcoming generation. It's, I guess like more so they're like worried about losing their own youth, I guess, but it's like, Probably. it's gone, man. <laughs> so it's, it's the just... same, it's the same people that, you know, they were bitching about your music when you were a kid. Like, exactly yeah and it was know, like shaking their fist at it you darn kids <laughs> and your devil music 
Oh, looks like we cut off. My internet is stuck or your internet is stuck. It's trying. Uh, you're right. Uh, the internet, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but the internet is, we are stuck. Yeah, you can get all. I'm gonna send you a message. There you are, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that. Yeah. I think I don't know if that was on my side or your side, but the internet just went wonky. Oh, it's doing it again. <laughs> I think we're. I think the internet is telling us to go bye byes. <laughs> this is what I see right now. Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> I think I think our internet is trying to be like, okay, you guys, quit talking. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. I don't... Okay. Yeah. Can you it's hear being... me? I can. Yeah. Now I can. Okay. The, yeah. There's definitely some net congestion, I think, going on. Yeah. Well, we've got some bad storms over here right now, and oh. I think that might be messing with my signal. But yeah, this is a good test because when I work from home, it's going to be all like, you know, wireless unless I hardwire this thing to my modem, which I think I'll yeah. probably do. <laughs> That's what I do because otherwise it can be inconsistent. Yeah. Oh, there you go again. <laughs> I think that. Oh, yeah. I think you're having your storms must be creating a internet drama. Are you back? Yeah, but uh, oh, yeah, you froze again. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording because I think the internet is down because of your storms and I don't think you can hear me right now. So I'm going to stop recording. So um, this was a fun ending to this and I will see you guys next time. <laughs> Weird.